Welcome to Press Start Turbo. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about Steam Next Fest demos and a couple of the biggest stories from last week. Then we're going to be joined by Hilltop Works to talk about fan translation for video games. A Finally, we're going to be... <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with you? How do you ruin the I intro? Didn't... Cameron has kept this show running, oiled, and geared. <clears throat> Finally, we're going to be talking about Stalker, as voted by the Patreon. By gaming news, we mean ga gaming news story, because there's not much. No, there is not a lot. This has been, uh, honestly, thankfully, a uh, relatively <laughs> snow. Happy. Yeah, kind of happy that there hasn't been like massive fucking stories that have broken. Um, I mean, you know, watch, okay, my, there, watch my words. By the time this episode comes out, I'm sure something well, massive will also, happen. Well, also, the day that we put out the last episode, Sega of America laid off 10% of its staff. Oh, uh, I thought, right. Mm. Still haven't got an episode without mentioning layoffs. So. <laughs> it's how it fucking is. It's literally every episode. I mean, I'm going to be honest. I have nothing to say about it. Just go watch the last episode I, or the one before then. I was getting ready to say we're finally laying off the layoffs, dude. Nah. Nope. We're not laying off the layoffs because it's never fucking happening. Reverse layoffs. Power World is hiring. <laughs> is Are they? Yeah, they are. They they have like a, well, they have like a skeleton crew working on their game. So I, I, I've seen a couple of things where they're trying to hire... Um, uh, they hire internationally, but they need somebody, of course, to speak like Japanese. Yeah, they are. I mean, that they are hiring. Well, there you go. That is a reverse. Did layoff. we just want to get the <laughs> stupid news out of the way first? Uh, let's let's do it. Let, let's do it. I, I All right. We w this is going to be the most positive episode we've ever done, because after talking about shit we hate or things we're making fun of, we get to talk about games we like. Mm. Uh, we'll start it off with um, Xbox. Uh, it hasn't. Well, he's come out and basi basically like said that it's going to be happening, right? But basically, there have been rumors and like listings that a bunch of Xbox exclusives are now going to be um, multi, -platform. multi platform and available on PlayStation. Mm -hmm. And this has gotten a lot of Xbox fans very angry. Uh, <laughs> taking to like Twitter to just like shit on Phil Spencer, say he's like a a bit a traitor. How dare you put Starfield on PlayStation? <laughs> uh. <laughs> There's a bunch of fucking X. <clears throat> I'm gonna vomit when I say it. Xbox content creators. Whoa! <gasps> and uh, I I just saw them go fucking crazy on Twitter, getting mad about this like the multi platform games that are coming out. Oh my god! You're telling Guys. me that you're gonna give Sony Rise, Son of Rome? <laughs> you're gonna give those gay station fans. Recore? You're gonna let them play Crackdown 3 with Terry Crews? I just look, I think it's like an insanely over like I, okay, I understand people who might have bought Xboxes thinking that like man, I, I I only care about Xbox exclusives, that's why I'm not gonna get Sony's one, you Yikes. know. And now like they're like, fuck, I should have bought a PlayStation. Now then I would have been able to get like all of the games, because all of the Microsoft games. But like, your problem isn't you know the fact that other people can play the same games that you previously had exclusive to your like console the problem is that not every game is available on every platform and that's just like the way the fucking business works and it sucks and but like i don't know more people being able to play your game isn't the isn't the problem this should be good shouldn't you be happy that people can play rise son of Rome? shouldn't you be happy that more people can uninstall xbox exclusives after an hour of play oh. they should give them halo 5 so playstation fanboys don't want anything else they go you know what we're fine. I mean, the re realistically, like, I, I, I mean, of course, this is uh, like a, 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 a non sequitur almost. It's only tangentially related. But realistically, like, Xbox does not have, uh, like, system sellers. So them putting their mm. games no. on uh, 
other platforms is just them trying to kind of expand their base a little bit. I mean, we, we're making like we we've been making like jokes about exclusives that were flops, but real like realistically, Psychonauts two, Sea of Thieves, Hi Fi Rush, like they they've made some bangers, Sunset Overdrive, Ori, but none of those sell consoles. A lot of Microsoft's exclusive also for like the last generation and a half have been on PC. Yeah, well, same, well PlayStation has started doing the exact same thing where they release... Yeah, uh, but their, they, they wait like a year and a half, two years before they yeah, put it on. They usually do it as like a marketing push for the sequel for whatever yeah. game's coming out, which... I think you know, uh, a big thing related to multi-platform too is with them purchasing Activision Blizzard mm -hmm. is that it, I, I think this is a, a part and parcel like business, but also a uh, goodwill gesture. Because like mm -hmm. if they if they don't go multi plat and they just restrict you know Call of Duty and all these big mega fuck games that Activision Blizzard puts out and, and they just keep them on PC and Xbox only the casual gamer is going to be incensed to riot. The FTC really I, got on their ass. Yeah, the casual gamer the casual gamer will be out there on the streets with torches. They'll fucking riot. Also, like this was the most obvious thing that was ever going to happen because this is the way that they've been angling with like Game Pass and their like move yeah. to PC and all this stuff like Microsoft soft they're they're not selling consoles in the way that they used to be they're they're not a platform they the are absolutely not like it's uh, they want to be their own live service model uh, exactly. I, do, I do like because i haven't been following xbox at all so i <clears throat> i am curious about how how come like because i remember when i was when i was growing up when i got my i got like i was like adamant i want my i want my oh i guess it was halo 3 wasn't it mm. halo 3 was a fucking or halo was always the system seller but even then halo infinite came out halo 5 came out and those were not system sellers was it just a market that just shifted from people wanting to play halo to not i don't know um i mean those games were also not as uh, good, a, a, so. a, a big thing this can all be this can all uh much like like Ronald Reagan, I saw a tweet. Go back. Uh, oh my God, where are we much going? Much like Ronald Reagan, the Xbox One press conference was the Ronald Reagan of gaming. This can all be traced back to the Xbox One press conference. Oh, I forgot about that. The fucking you have to, and you also yeah. had to buy a fucking. Didn't you also have to have the Kinect, and it was like an extra two hundred or something? And shit? always on, and you couldn't, you couldn't pre no pre owned games. Remember that? Look, you can, but you can watch the football on the Xbox. And it was a big like you can connect your tv mm. to your xbox and watch tv oh, on your xbox the football that's on the right xbox. The that's Super Bowl. right Come to your Xbox. They've been doing some fucking terrible decisions. That, wow. That Sony, like, how to share your PS4 games video. The shockwaves are being felt to Mo this day. Most most BTFO'd company of all time. <laughs> well, Microsoft isn't an entertainment company. They're a fucking, so <laughs> like, a technology company. Sony is Sony knows, like, yeah. the entertainment market and had been doing it for, like, many more years. They're trying to run it as, like, a technology mm. business and be like, look at all the cool bells and whistles without like understanding what you know gamers team are into in a way okay you say that but like remember when the original xbox was out and they had like dwayne the rock johnson pointing at it and yeah like that's true xbox don't you want that that's because that's because they were like oh shit we need it we'll get some fucking people who know what they're doing to like start marketing this like xbox at the start and then it started making money and then then they're like oh let, let the no, money like, like obviously yeah they got really complacent during the 360 because the the ps3 the ps3 literally did the same thing in, in a similar way yeah. when it launched that that the xbox one did where it basically they were like 500 dollars. here's an ad with a baby uh you can get fucking uh wasn't it 500 mag 599 us dollars everybody was like uh ridge racer and they were like ridge <laughs> racer and it plays blu-rays uh, the cell processor is the future i'm gonna be honest that was that was the reason why my family got a fucking yeah, a, a lot of people bought ps3s just because i mean we Blu -rays. bought it we bought it like way way later like the slim mm. i can't remember the slim when the slim the came slim or out, the super slim yeah late. the super slim was no, it? Well, no, it no, would have no, been no. the slim because the it, super it, slim is the one that has the weird tray thing, isn't yeah, it? It's on the, the top, the one yeah, that like slips around. Yeah, 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 no, that's not the one. Uh, we we had the slim. It would be the slim, yeah, because we wanted to watch fucking I don't know Stuart Little on Blu-ray. Norbit. I mean, generationally, like it is really interesting to look at the um the the PS3 versus 360, and then to watch Xbox kind of grow complacent. They really did, and uh. then the Xbox One, it was like. 
Oh, you can watch TV on your Xbox. You can play Dead Rising uh, 3. Uh, yeah. And it's like, uh, dude. And then well, on the other hand, Rough. like PlayStation did, they're like, you can just share games. They got exclusive contracts for like Call of Duty. Um, And then they uh, eventually had one video game. Mm. They had Bloodborne. Well, I want to say, I want to say like Xbox One. People have said this before, but um, the P- PS4 and Xbox One generation, that was when people were building their like digital libraries. So, you know, before it was like, you know, Xbox, you know, they are the front runners for this generation. Previously, PS2 and stuff like that. But now it's like everyone's kind of locked into their platform. Like, if you've bought, like, over 200 games on PlayStation, you're not going to then switch to the Xbox Series X because you're like, I like a box better than the fucking no. weird Wi-Fi router the PS5 has or whatever. Like, you're going to be like, well, I have all of my fucking games on PlayStation. I'm going to get the new PlayStation. Yeah, I mean, you're totally right. Especially with PS4. Like, I like all my PS4 exactly. games are on my PS5, so why would I ever even think about getting a series x something that playstation did very well at the end of the ps3 life cycle um that also helped aside from like the press conference and like the the idea of xbox is they had a couple of really good exclusives come out on ps3 and then they were bundling ps3s with grand theft auto 5 mm. oh smart. oh wow <laughs> i didn't know that but that's a uh... A big thing yeah. that Sony had right before this press conference that I don't think a lot of people think about it from like the retail aspect of it is they were bundling PS3s with Grand Theft Auto V. I bought a PS3 back then. Yeah. I, I was a community college student and I was a PC only gamer and I was like, oh, fuck yeah, PS3, like $200, Grand Theft Auto V. I can just fucking play it because it's not on PC yet. Oh, hell yeah. And I knew a ton of people um, in my circle and outside of my circle that were picking up the PS3 just for Grand Theft Auto V because it'd be a year or two before the PC yep. release. And also that's a fucking, now that's a system and then seller. You're in the ecosystem and once you're in the ecosystem, you want to stay in that ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it is really interesting, I think, that Xbox is 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 trying to shift away from just being like exclusive and more about like, hey, we want our, mm. our services mm. everywhere because we want everybody attached to our ecosystem because that's kind of the the end all be all is everybody's attached. The problem is their their ecosystem is you don't own anything and it's their ecosystem is basically they put all their chips into Game Pass and like I'm sorry but I I don't care for Game Pass as much as I care for like my PS4 or like my PlayStation library, you know, cuz I own I tech I mean, okay. I own, in parentheses, my PlayStation games, but on Game Pass, they can just disappear tomorrow. Let me let me think like a marketing, let me think like a Microsoft guy or a marketing guy. Yeah. Like, like okay, you are in a, you, you are a mom, right? Yes, I'm in, a mom. In a, in a GameStop, right? Yes. And the employee tells you, hey, um, you could just buy this video game or you can buy this card. I mean, an, a GameStop employee would never say this, but like the idea is, yes. hey, uh, you can buy this $60 video game Oh. for your kid or you can buy this $12 card for game pass and that applies oh. to uh, so, sorry sir sorry sir he he my child is eating the game stop stop that germ stop that jeremy <laughs> stop eating the games but the, the idea he is loves the dude, edges of the games it feels good on his uh still developing teeth it's crazy that your son is a kobold um the if you buy this card it doesn't matter if you have a pc an xbox or a ps4 this 12 dollar card or this 60 dollar card for the same price of this game gets you games unlimited games for a year versus one video game for unlimited games but no games <laughs> I, I, yeah, well, I mean, that's that's basically what Game Pass is. This is unlimited games, but no games. And that's I I I feel like I feel it's not a, it's you know I don't mm-hmm. talk to marketing executives at Microsoft. I don't have like a beat on them. But this is what it it, it feels like. They they want more people in I their ecosystem, guess. even if they're in a different ecosystem. Well, the they also problem own is all the games now. The problem is PlayStation. Yeah, but the problem is PlayStation has an equivalent of Game Pass, and it's also good. Not as good. Not as good. I can't. I can't say it's not as good. But PlayStation Plus, pretty good. Well, yeah, because the ideal, the ideal of having your customer pay is the end all of the product. Like, why would you want somebody to buy a video game once That's and true. then that used copy you make no profit of it? You want somebody to give you money forever to be able to play a continual amount of content. I also, I do, I do want to say I don't think Sony is ever going to let Game Pass on PlayStation. Like there's no, no. chance. No, no, Cause, no, no. Because they 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 have the yeah. equivalent. But like that's that's the ideal. It feels like it, it it may be like a 
hey, you know, we're going to let you have like Call of Duty and stuff. We'll put like hey. multi-platforms on there. Could you maybe give us a smidgen of Game Pass for a little Call of Duty? I mean, it feels <laughs> partially like a, game pass. like a negotiating mm-hmm. tactic in a way. Of course, like take this all with a grain of salt. This is all just oh, uh, speculation. Yeah. Like I'm not speaking fact here. I'm just I'm just uh, a psycho gamer analyzing. The only fact is that it's hilarious that people yeah. are mad. The only fact is that it's hilarious if they ever ship PS5 copies of Starfield. I, I want to see the physical version. The physical version <laughs> of Starfield. You get a vinyl sticker of Todd Howard, and if you put it on your PlayStation, it breaks the system. <laughs> I want to see a physical fucking like a fucking the hardware itself, just like a fucking PS5 official skin for Starfield. That would be wild. All right, did we want to move on to Steam Next Fest demos, or do we want to Next Fest demos? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I don't think we have anything else to talk about except Steam Next Fest, and uh, this is something I feel like. Oh, I mean, we're Skull and Bones. Like, uh, we stopped calling oh, the other Bones. You want to talk about it? It's very yeah. funny. You want to talk fucking, about it real quick? I, don't, I want to talk about. Quadruple A game. Quadruple A gaming. <laughs> it's gotta be $70. This isn't even the first time people have used Quadruple A. Like, I remember Quadruple A for... Oh, God, what was the Perfect last? Dark. Yeah, Perfect Dark. Um, That was the first one that I can think Perfect of. Perfect Dark? Yeah, did that game no. even come oh, out? No. That's r- <laughs> no, it's not okay. out yet. That's the first time I ever heard Quadruple A was Microsoft being like, it's going to be the first Quadruple A game and never elaborated on what that means. Oh, that's why I bought an Xbox. I'm going to vomit. I can't wait for Perfect uh. Dark. Yeah, I just want to say for context, we're talking about uh, Yves, Yves Girl, Girl Mot? I don't know. Yves Gilmo. Yves Gilmo. Basically, the, the price of fuck. Skull and Bones, the like live service, only the ship part of um, Black Flag. Uh, he says it's a $70 uh, price tag for this game. And is like it's quadruple A, and people will see how big the game is. It's gonna be it's bigger than triple A. Yeah, it's a pirate video game that has less pirating than Sid Meier's Pirates. <laughs> sea of Thieves exists. Wait, why the fuck would you think the Sea of Thieves people would go from that to this? Well, like the biggest thing is it's only ship combat. The biggest too. thing is Who cares? how the fuck would you make a video game that is literally only ship combat, wherein the boarding is you press a button, it plays a one second cutscene, and then you get everything off of the ship. When the pirate fantasy is about physically boarding the ship, getting on the yeah. ship, killing the captain, either taking or scuttling their ship. And exploring the fucking seas and exploring islands. Like, I'm sorry. This is a mini game, dude. Also, I think he's just calling it quadruple A because... Buzzword. Buzzword, one. And because of how much fucking money they've spent on this game with its insane development time and how turbulent it's all been. I swear to God. Just watch One Piece. Motherfuckers should have just watched five seconds of One Piece. This game has been coming out for almost ten years, it feels like, at this point. No, like, actually... When when was this originally slated to release? Because I know that it's been delayed, like, a million times. Last year? Was it last year? No, that's not the original No, no, before that. I think it was, like, 2017 or, or 18... I'm pretty sure. Hold on, I'm, I'm, Wait, are I'm you checking fucking this. Kidding? I'm checking this. I can't even remember. I can't even remember. When is it supposed... Oh, oh, it's coming out. No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's initial release target was 28. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, it was, it was around that time. Oh, it it's came not, out. Uh, it's open it beta. Came out. What? It's open beta. The oh, the no, open it, beta came out, but you have to pay for it. It, it, it comes out a week from now. It comes out February 16th. So it is coming out. It's coming out. It is coming out. Let Finally. us know if you bought a copy of yeah. Skull and Bones. People put, post your pre-orders in the comments. <laughs> the, the the open beta, I watched about 20 to 30 minutes of gameplay and like I, I've seen nothing. I, it's so depressing like watching oh, no. the, the ship just literally shoot harpoons and out of their ship and then you see like a rah as your guys jump on and then it's just you opening a chest and getting like 15 different rarity crafting materials i mean if anything this game looks fucking boring as shit and kind of ugly i don't know why they really made this game look kind of ugly just go, go play, play sea Myers Pirates. Well, just go play sea it, it's uh, there's no yeah. art there's no like art like i don't know Great news well, if you're on PlayStation. Maybe you'll get Sea of Thieves. <laughs> Go have fun with that. <laughs> Chad Warden saying Sea of Thieves nuts fit in your mouth. Thank you, Chad Warden. Oh, hell yeah. Skull Skull and Bones just looks like it's so... Um, I don't know how to uh, explain it, but it looks like the... Skull and Bones is a quintessential slop video game because it looks like a yes. character would be playing it in the background of a movie or a television show that would go straight to Netflix with only five grandmas watching I would it. also say, Billy... Is it, this a can't... 
is this a campaign there seems to be a story oh who cares uh, it's look it's it's had like one of the most turbulent like dev mm. cycles since duke nukem forever and it's um you know there's reports where like they're from ex developers who've left since that are just like yeah though no, this sucks the mis there's been cr incredibly mismanaged a, f a great quote mm. that i always love is uh, skull and bones design had been so turbulent decisions such as do you play as a pirate or do you play as a boat went round in circles as management tried to oh decide what kind of game God. to make so like are you the pirate or are you the boat and they didn't they they couldn't come i to think you're you play uh, as a pirate now I, i'm pretty sure they they decided on that because from what i'm seeing in the game no you play the as a boat you only like dive. get off of the ship <laughs> oh. to get crafting materials and to upgrade the boat oh, you why, the boat. oh. why do you have a you have a creator character what's the fucking point you do he only gets off of the boat to go and talk to merchants and vendors when you get crafting <laughs> materials too you literally just saddle up to a shore and then press the hatchet button and it cuts down the trees that are on shore Stop. you don't even get on the island for a bunch of the crafting stuff oh you barely man. get off the boat the, the the biggest thing that I see, the biggest like fumble with this, honestly, and I don't know why nobody said, hey, why don't we just make a single player pirate game a la Black Flag, but without the Assassin's Creed dressing, because this will sell much better and yes. much more. And it's because the, the much like a pirate, she sees a, a shiny doubloon. So too will a corporate executive at Ubisoft see our battle pass, live <laughs> service. <laughs> oh, we can sell so many ship I cosmetics. Mean, couldn't, why couldn't you do... But why couldn't you do a live service for an actual game? Uh, because like about pirates. You are the boat. Be the boat, Monty. Dude, I'm surprised that's not the slogan because you just sold me on this game. Become the boat. You are the boat. Just like Lightning McQueen is a car in Disney's cars, so too in Ubisoft Skull and Bones shall ye be a boat. Uh, dude, how much time you want to before we get the stupidest fucking ugly ass cosmetics in a, this battle pass? When are we going to get this googly is, eyes for the fucking no, giant no, googly you're, eyes? You're an idiot. It's going to be Rayman co cosmetics. You're going to get oh, Rayman flags. Oh, it's going to be like the rainbow unicorn. It's yeah. going to be the rainbow unicorn stuff like in Valhalla where you can get like all the unicorn stuff on your boats. Freaking awesome. I wonder how many different Assassin's Creed clothes you can put on your pirate. Dude, you can yeah. be Altier or Ezio. Remember when they made good video games? Anyway, play uh, Frontiers of Pandora. This blue people. Oh, man. Oh, imagine you can There's play as people. a Navi ship. That'd be fucking epic. Oh, yeah. In Skull and Bones, I run a Navi Windrunner. Uh, it's got five. It's got plus five defense, and I've got 12 Navi cannons on it. You know what? Just talking about it, it convinced me. I'm going to I'm gonna buy the digital deluxe right now. 155, 150, I mean, Canadian dollars. I can't wait to buy the digital deluxe ultimate edition for $20 in two Fuck years. yes. How many season pass steps do you skip by getting the digital deluxe version? That's the real oh, point. Oh, I bet oh, it let's at be least real. I bet, it, I bet it skips none. None. I <laughs> guarantee you i'm gonna check anyway let's talk about steve next first demos i'm fucking sick of this stupid oh. shit. wait wait wait, wait, wait. I, I found it i found it i found it you do not skip any you do not skip anything you do get wait do you even get it <laughs> no way <gasps> i don't know usually you, get you don't the, get the season pass with the deluxe you edition do not you gotta get buy the, the ultimate you don't or gold get edition it. to get the season oh pass my god oh no no uh, you do you do you do oh you okay. do oh no you don't no, wait, oh, this, this, wait, this, it, is, this is this is you, flipping and following me this is ah. weird. It gives you the smuggler. Am I getting it or am I not? It gives you the smuggler pass token, which unlocks the premium sl smuggler pass, which is usable once on any season. Okay, I see. Oh, so if you don't like the first season, you don't need to. Yeah, because there's going to be multiple seasons uh, for this game. Don't worry. Don't worry. Oh, yeah? Let's, you let's check up again on in, on this game in five months. <laughs> it along with Suicide Squad. Oh, uh, man. We, we got to move on. Yeah, we should. We should do the part uh, of video games that is fun, which is playing fun video games and smiling because oh, you're having a fun Steam, time. Honestly, Steam Next Fest is probably the best thing oh, that Steam does every year. Uh, for people who are not aware of what Steam Next Fest is, they're basically showing off like these ne the next games, like the next developers, these like new new creative voices that want to like show off their stuff, and you can mm. play the demos and like you get some 
indie games in there that are so fucking creative and every year there's so much cool stuff it's a bunch of fun little indie demos it feels like what i imagine walking the floor of e3 would have been like in like you know 2000 yeah. like 11 or something like that you know where you're just there's yeah. just like a bunch of like small devs set up with like little play kits and you just get to play these cool games and you're like damn this is sick and it's it's awesome. We got to do that at Magfest. There's always a indie dev arcade. There's actually one of the games that we're going to be talking about uh, right now is a game that we uh, we talked to the devs and we met the devs. I guess we should start with it. Yeah, start with it. My, yeah. My, yeah, Raw Metal. Uh, oh, it's so really sick. Really fucking good. I don't know if, like, as we speak, the demos are still up. I don't know if the demos are still going to be uh, up when we're done talking, but you should still follow the dev the devs on Steam, Wishlist the Games, and check them out on Twitter. All of it, these guys are fucking raw, crazy. Raw Metal comes out relatively soon, I thought. Does it? It's like next comes month, out in like March. Yeah, five weeks. I would also say I believe the Raw Metal demo was up before the next fest, so it might still be up afterwards. Could it? But um, I would, yeah. If, if any of the games we mentioned still have the demos up, please try them out. They're so cool. Raw Metal is... It's just, how do you describe it, just for people? For me, right now, it couldn't been it could not have come out at the best time, because mm. right now I'm kind of in a stealth mood ever since we did the Metal Gear Solid 3 episode. I finished playing Metal Gear Solid 3, uh, finished 4, now I'm on to 5, and I've been playing a lot of stealth, and Raw Metal is a... <laughs> it's a stealth game. It's a beat em up. 3D fighter beat em up. Yeah, like a la y- and it's Yakuza. a roguelike ish. It's 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 a it's a weird stealth beat em up dungeon crawler is like the best way to describe it. Yes, dungeon crawler makes more sense than roguelike. You're totally right. It's there's so much to it, and you get like I I, I it's really hard to describe. And it's really weird because it sounds like something that would play like shit. Like, no, it it just sounds like it would be a nightmare to play, but it plays like a fucking dream. And the the combat is really cool. Basically, like your your little character, you, you you when you do a sneak attack. You go into this like uh, little mode Tekken where forces X mode. It's so cool. You have to find access cards to open like chests or open like new areas in this little dungeon type deal thing. It's got a really it's cool so art cool. style too. It's super yeah. stylish as well. Yeah, very stylish. Very cool. I, that that one was one of the the top picks that I had uh, from the next fist demo. Yes. I also um I, I know. And we've talked about this, um, but um, Bel- Beltra? Bellatro. 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 I don't know how to pronounce yeah, it. Yeah, Bellatro is really cool. It is a poker roguelike, and it, sound, with it sounds... With gimmicks. With gimmicks. With gimmicks. <laughs> with, it, which sounds, you yeah, like, when you say that, it, it sounds, sounds stupid. awful. <laughs> but it's, like, probably one of the most addicting roguelikes I've played. Oh, like, yeah. The the first note that I wrote when I because I've been taking notes while I was playing game. The first note that I wrote was, "Oh no, I'm going to lose hours of my life to this." I, it's so addicting. I sunk like five and a half hours into the demo, and it comes out in two weeks, and I'm going to sink so much more time into it. It's phenomenal. It's one of my favorite games I've played like recently, just in general. I love the presentation. Is yeah. so good. I was going to say the presentation is like amazing. Very, uh, Microsoft solitaire esque, but like yeah, the, they got the fucking sound of the cards riffling like. Perfect. Ooh, it sounds it's- yeah, it <laughs> sounds perfect, and like it, it, it's not just like about winning a certain ante or winning is it is ante the word i'm looking for or bid uh pot pot it's not about winning like a certain amount of money or blind it's not about winning a certain blind it's like you get gimmicks like you have these cards that do some fucking weird ass shit to the game and you have you have the joker the joker cards in the game are giving you passive boosts while you're playing the game one of the jokers that i love is it's like oh you you can make um 
flushes and straights with four cards instead of a whole hand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Which really makes it good. really easy. Or there, there's there's one where it's like, oh, you, you can do a straight, if but like you can skip a card here or there. So you can do like two, three, five, six, seven. It's a straight mm-hmm. then. Just skip and, the and then you have like boss fights as well. It's so weird. Some of the boss fights are bullshit. I hate the one where you just draw oh. your entire hand upside down. Oh, that one. Yeah. It's like, I don't know what cards I'm playing. I'm just going to click left or right and hope that I'm doing something. Yeah. It's super creative. I'm super excited. Like the demo that you get to play, like I could, I could have spent hours playing it. I did it. spend hours like, playing it. And to, and to think that the full game is going to have even more like modifiers and different like bosses and different hands and stuff like that. It just, I'm, I'm very, very excited for this. This was like a it's, huge, I think, I think this is one of those games that's going to be an all timer for time wasting. Oh, yeah. It's so fun. And I, I, I and that comes out on February 20th. So that one's really yes. soon. Very, very soon for that one. Brendan, have you played any Nick's Fest? Games? Yeah, I didn't play either of those games. Um, so there were a couple <laughs> of games I played during the Next Fest. Yeah. Uh, I wish I'd played some of them while more awake, i.e. like Pacific Drive I'm very excited about. Uh, I just loved... I played it for about an hour, and I loved like kind of just driving around, picking up materials, uh, mm-hmm. ripping away cars, and like exploring little anomalies. Another one saw, that's saw on what Net- is that? Wait, wait, wait. What? Uh, what is that? What is that? What is that it's about? about uh, a big drive. wall. Because dude. everybody, everybody requested I play that game when I asked for recommendations on Twitter, and I just didn't have time to check it out. So I am curious about it because it it definitely landed an impact on people. It's like a big. It, it, it's it's stalker esque, but not quite. Mm-hmm. Now that I've played played stalker i have a better idea of like stalker-esque mm-hmm. um basically you are driving this this car uh and like upgrading and changing out parts kind of like my summer car a little bit uh you get sucked oh, into this walled yeah. away portion of of the world uh that is like uh filled with these anomalies that i haven't like explored fully but essentially you're you're driving your car and picking up materials and and trying to get somewhere so you need to get to where you're going uh and it also mm-hmm. has a, just a really cool kind of road trip experience to it yep. uh and and the the like anomalies and weird shit that you find helps with the exploration like it's so interesting mm-hmm. everything that you like mannequins that are standing around glowing red that if you accidentally drive into they explode <laughs> It's. I would say it's also like a kind of a single player extraction game in some ways. Like you're go. The, the idea is that you go to an area and then you've got an objective to do, and then you're like finding loot and putting it into your car so you can build your car back up. And then at the end, you have to like get out of the zone, and then there like there'll be like a fucking zone that comes in and and starts to fuck with you, and shit starts going wrong. It's pretty cool. I thought I thought when I first started playing it, it was gonna like lean more into the horror aspects but it is it's more like just like a cool mystery like like oh what the fuck's going on oh kind let of me, thing l- let me tell you i i had some really horrifying moments so like, oh really oh. yeah i had moments where i would go into a house and i would hear like screaming or weeping and i would fucking find one of those awful mannequins that are glowing everywhere mm. around the house like i I, oh. I will tell you there is there is going to be more in the full release, I believe, but I enjoyed okay. I enjoyed my time with it and I, I wish I had been more awake when I played it. Cameron played on baby mode. I I didn't I really like you describing it as like my stalker car. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's I, I, it I would that's say such a good way to sell it to me. The only <laughs> negative thing the only negative thing that I would say is I do wish that it didn't do like the you got to pick up your crafting materials. You got to get your plastic and your rubber and your metals and your um, and, and yeah. the inventory system though is interesting because it's um structured a la Resident Evil suitcase style where you have to kind mm-hmm. of like oh. place things properly in its space as well as with the car and your backpack. There Pacific Drive is really interesting and I think it might be a little bit of an indie sleeper hit. I enjoyed my time with it and I want to play more. Yeah, because you all of your equipment that you use is destructive uh, has destructible durability. Yeah. Durability. Mm-hmm. Um, so like y- y- even your things that you use to get other materials but then it's like i found it pretty pretty forgiving um with like how much how much stuff you need you can get a, you can make a scrapper easily to be able to like rip apart other cars and you can hoard materials if you want uh but otherwise you almost always have enough to make the yeah. like basic tool set mm-hmm. um another video game i played that has a demo during the next fest that i really really enjoyed um but i didn't play the demo during the next fest abiotic factor 
I recommend this to anybody who has friends. Oh, I haven't heard of this Play one. the free demo for it. It's basically Half-Life Scientists, uh, The Forest. Oh, my oh, God. Yeah, that this. sounds really this. silly. So it's like locked away in, locked away. Basically, think of it like, what if you weren't Gordon Freeman? What if you were a bunch of guys locked away in Black Mesa trying to figure out what oh, the fuck going man. on? Oh, that sounds really That fun. sounds fun. It's fun as hell. And it's got, um, it's got VoIP. It's got like proximity VoIP. So uh, you can turn it on to where your character's mouths are moving. So you could just I I loved playing this with friends for a couple of hours and then just talking like a half life scientist the whole time. Like, what is this? <laughs> come over here, check this out. It's always fun Ouch. to like do like a little bit of role play in like stupid games like that. It's always fun. Yeah, sp- especially when they like have mechanics like that where your your the character's lips move. That 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 really helps yeah. sell it. Oh that's, yeah, that's fun. It and it's got it. and yeah. it's got stats like physical strength, mental, and I'm like, ooh, I love it when video games have stats. Uh, one game that I really, really, really enjoyed playing was Pepper Grinder. I don't, I don't know if anybody else played Pepper Grinder. I did, but uh, it's a platformer. It's a, it, it's, it, it's a really, uh. really. <laughs> I know, Brendan. I know. <laughs> it's a, it's a platformer with a gimmick. Where and usually I'm not into those, but the gimmick is so well implemented and it's so fun to use that I don't mind. Basically, you have a giant ass drill on your arm and you can use your drill to dive into water or dive into sand and then pop back up. And the way they use the drill in so many different ways in the three levels that were available in the demo and just the level design being incredible it, it feels like um it feels like a mario game with like the hidden coins and everything it's so fun it's really simple it's really fun uh, it's uh, like shovel knight meets celeste i see you <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've never played they, those games. They, uh, they made a whole game out of the yellow drill from Sonic Colors. I mean, kind of, except it's not Sonic, so it's good. <laughs> I want to. I've got a game that's kind of similar to that that I played, which is like a Metroidvania um, called Eden's Ooh. Guardian. Um, mm-hmm. It's a pretty interesting one. It's a, it's another one where it's like, oh, I can see the the influences of this game, but it's a cool gimmick. Is is like basically it's all about throwing your sword. Um, and you like throw your sword into like, uh, dudes and then like you can teleport to them, but also it has this really cool one where it has like little bits of metal on the side of the wall that if you throw your sword at it, you then it will like bounce off and you've got to like time it with the platforming. So then you'll jump to the sword and then dash and stuff like that. Kind of like Celeste. You're so shard blade core. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty, (laughs) (laughs) it was pretty cool. It's (laughs) worth checking out. The demo is pretty, uh, pretty short. Um, and, uh. Yeah, I, I had fun with that one. That's one to keep an eye on. Oh, uh, Billy, we played uh, Dysomancer. Oh, Dysomancer that, is that fucking was a fun weird. That that was also like because another gimmicky game, uh, but like a good very, one. It's very gimmicky. But I, a good one because uh, I'm gonna. You're the one who told me to yeah, play because uh, you were like, it's really I was, interesting. I was, I was like, it's like and Slay the Spire. When, yeah, and when I played it, I was like, oh. It's literally fucking Slay the Spire. For, it is, this is like, it, it's like shameless how much it is like Slay the Spire. For the first the like 80% of the prologue, I could hear you yes. like not really giving a shit about it. Because you were like, oh, it's like Slay the Spire with like a cute little art style. The art style is very cute to be fair. It's like whatever. It's very cute. It's like, uh, they look like little sketchbook pencil drawings. And then the game pulls the rug under you. Yeah. And it gets weird. Uh, the gimmick of that game is it's like Slay the Spire, but with like D20 and like DC checks and D8s and D6s. Um, but my absolute favorite part of it, and the thing that carries it, is there's a mechanic uh, where you can take any of the numbers that you see on the screen, any number at all, and like replace it with a dice roll. Reroll it. Yeah. If you're against a boss. That has 99 like defense and like 500 health. There's zero way you're ever going to beat him. You can use your skill to re roll with a D6 or higher, depending, like, depending on where you are in the game. And you can re roll the stats of any number. And I mean, any number, even the number your screen basically like shows all every number in pink. And you can change the number of cards in your deck or like how much energy you get because billy was like 
I don't want to have just four and just like roll the dice and got a five. So it's like, oh, you just have five energy. You now. can just re-roll the amount of like the amount of turns you can do. Like it's fucking it, it's so interesting. I've never it's very overpowered, but the game is balanced with the idea that you are overpowered and you yeah. need to be overpowered for a lot of it. But it it's also fucking excellent. It also balances it on the map. Um, because on the map, there's like a purple fog that chases you. And the more you use that power, the faster the fog gets like per move. And if you get caught, then it, you're in over. for a world of hate. It's a, it's a very cool little game. Speaking of weird games, did anyone else play Indica? No, okay. I have not. I have not this but is... I have seen, I, I'm going to be honest. I saw it and I told myself, oh my God, it looks so pretentious. And that's, I didn't play it. It's weird. It's it's a really strange game. It's you. So you're. It's like a puzzle. Uh, I don't know, like a pu puzzle, like exploration game in a way, where it's just like a narrative driven one. But it's it does. You're basic. So you play a, like a Russian nun in this like alternate history, and you have a voice in your head which is literally the devil. And it plays this, like, weird, like, I don't even know how to describe the, like, techno-Russian music it plays whenever the devil's, like, fucking with you. And it's, I don't, I don't know how I feel about it. It's certainly interesting. What? But. <laughs> Wait, what do you mean you don't know how to feel about, what do you, what do you mean anything? What is this? It's, I don't know. It's really hard to describe. It's one of those games where you kind of have to just, like, play the demo and, like, see for yourself in a lot of ways. But, yeah, I don't know. So, no one else played it. I've got no other... I've got no one else to, to back me up here. Um, Mandy has played it because he told me, but... I just pulled up the uh, the trailer and I hear what you're talking about with the music. And the, that's the music? selling me. Just because yeah, that, that's, okay. so, that's such a strange stylistic choice. I love it's that. It's a really interesting stylistic choice. There's a bunch of stuff. And it's like you pray at these like altars and you get these like points. And I, I was like, I guess they're prayer points. I don't know. And it's... <laughs> yeah, I, I'm there. there's like a score at the top, right? Yeah, it, there's a score at all times. And I have no idea what the fuck it means. Like it's, and the the demo just drops you like clearly like halfway through the game or something because you have no idea what the hell's going <laughs> on. It's uh, it's very interesting. Um, but okay, yeah. I'll I'll put this one on my radar. Time. Weird, interesting. Brendan, did you have any other games you wanted to talk about? Uh, I played C Crow Country, and that's a little fun. Ye that's my favorite game that I played by that's far. Pretty fun, Crow Country. Pretty dang fun. I like the aesthetic a lot. I thought the gameplay would be. I was glad that, you know, in a world where a lot of people are making Resident Evil Silent Hill lives, <clears throat> uh, I'm glad yes. that it's not cumbersome. Nope, it's, it's not. Just, it feels great. It's cute, it feels great, and it's fun, and you can run back to your car and get ammo. One thing that I think is so good about this game, about Crow Country, is that the they modernize the controls so well, and I really like the way you shoot in that game. Instead of, like, the typical, like, just, you're, you, like, you can aim up and down and everything, and... It, it, the camera goes behind you. It just feels really good. It's really nice. I can't wait for the main game and also the the little the mystery that's happening right now in the demo. I'm excited for it. It's it's cool. I like that it kind of gives me the um in the Silent Hill video games like two and three. I feel like the theme park is never yes. explored enough. It's the I'm gonna be honest. It's the closest to a. It, it's weird because it's it, it feels and looks more like a Resident Evil game, but the when all the scares are very Silent Hill, and the vibes are also more like Silent Hill. Like when you're in the darkness and a creature just comes out of the darkness, that's like it's very Silent Hill. Also, the sound design is incredible on the monsters. Sometimes you just you don't see the monster yet, but you just hear like the fucked up little noises they make. It's like, oh, like, that? that? oh, there's a tall and man walking see, towards me. Yeah, ah. that's yeah, that's the one I was thinking about. The one that just goes. Yeah, he's just like, what is that sound? Oh, I'm just trying to do so, a puzzle here. Oh, oh, and then he come, he come, he come toward you. It's fucked up. <laughs> um, and then otherwise for me, um, I mean, I played a lot of slop this next fest like of course i did give I, us your give us your slop give us your best of slop uh, or worst probably of slop. beyond hanwell actually way more enjoyable than i thought it would be awesome um 
It's it's basically like uh, a chase die in it, but condemned. Oh, oh, that the the uh, the the that game, the 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 game that's uh yeah. It's okay. I, I you you told us about that game while we were recording uh, Tremors. Yeah, it's it's sloppy. it's the condemned. Yes, it's sloppy as hell. The best thing that I could say, say is like that. It reminds me a lot of Condemned, where you're like picking up melee yeah. weapons. They they have durability. You're fighting weird entities, and it was way more enjoyable than I thought it ever would be. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's good. Uh, like, narratively, I, I walked into this big pit where they've captured entities, and, like, one of them is just literally, oh, it's a mimic, like, in Prey, which I thought was neat, but then uh, it just is yeah. a big spider that turns into a bucket. <laughs> uh, and then they also have, like, uh, another thing that I, I want to play the full game for is they have a character... Uh, in one of the like vaults or prison cells called it and it's like a jester and it's like it's crazy but this thing it follows you around and i'm like oh it follows wow <laughs> uh and like there are like actual coca-cola cans spread around it's very weird oh man yeah no i was looking at some Ooh, of the licensing how to get in trouble i, I get really obsessive about um uh, product uh, assets and video games because i like to see how people do them uh, and just seeing, okay, there's Pepsi. Just, That's just funny. straight just up actual Coca Cola. <laughs> oh my God, they're gonna get in fucking trouble. <laughs> but it's only the cans. It's only the cans in the ground. That one was interesting. Uh, other ones I tried to play were I tried to play back rooms because I wanted to play like a back rooms uh, oh. analog, and it sucked. I played Dream Core, which has one like liminal space thing out, and it has a that one's fun. It's, it's just exploring yeah. liminal spaces. I uh, played Serum, which is like a survival video game where you got to get serum in. And that one has potential, but it didn't really grab me. Um, I have one game that I want to talk about because I just remembered another really, really addicting uh, game. Probably my favorite game loop. Like, it's so satisfying and it has a really good aesthetic. It's called Mullet Mad Jack. I played that one too. Uh, I How? downloaded it and didn't play it yet. Oh my God. It is addicting. You basically, it, it has the same vibe as, oh shit, what's that other? It's another FPS game where you have to keep killing or else you die. Uh, oh, are you Void. talking about the free one? Um, no. Oh, it's not, it, it's not free. Sure? It's like three bucks. Oh, it's like three bucks. Uh, shit. I, I love that game and I forget. Uh, Void. It's so fun. Void something. Damn uh, it. I, I will tell you in one second. It was post void. Post void. Post void. I love post it's void. It's basically it's basically post post void in the same way that it's you have to constantly like you have to constantly kill to up your the amount of time that you can stay alive. And it's easier than post void. Yeah, po post void there's, is there's, intentionally like yeah. Hard. There's like <laughs> upgrades and a bunch of things. The music is incredible. The aesthetics are fucking on point i love kicking a guy into a all, machine it's so fucking silly the the point of the game is that you're trying to save an influencer in like the in the fucking the influencer princess the influencer princess that it, it's really fucking funny and stupid the the aesthetic awesome. I, I loved and hated the aesthetic at the same time like part of me was like i love this but another part of me was there's like uh, there's parts. a fake twitch chat on the right the whole time and i was like oh. i kind of i i i thought that was like one of the funniest parts i i really like i that. have uh ptsd from borderlands 3 still so oh you're <laughs> fucked for life <laughs> yeah no mullet mad jack really fucking fun and the demo was very substantial as well like you can you can finish one of the like w one of the first floors two floors even and there's bosses and it's it's good it's good the the last game that i wanted to talk about was uh mouthwashing i wanted to make mention of uh, that because i played the demo for that and i really i really loved it uh they also made how fish is made which is like a it's got a parasite fish musical and a flesh katamari is that, moment um, in it. Yeah, is that Dread X? No, that's not Dread uh, X. That's a uh, wrong, wrong organ. organ it, is listed as developer on Steam, but I don't know enough uh, about the, uh, the game to know. There's a bunch of names next to it, so I think Wrong Organ published. Wrong Organ published and developer. It has the same vibe as like something Dread X would put out. That's why when I saw that, I was like, it's oh. really cool. I I. I loved the idea. I loved walking around the ship, interacting with things. Yeah. Um, I didn't get, there wasn't like a lot of puzzles in the demo, but the aesthetic and the, the storytelling, the narrative in the little like 30 minute demo they have is really, really good. It really, really it, it, it tranks my brain worms. Hell yeah. Last one I wanted to talk about was uh, Children of the Sun. 
Uh, oh, I, also I totally that. forgot to talk about that. It's <laughs> uh, so yeah. good. It's really, really good. Um, this is a puzzle shooter uh, in the sense that you are a sniper. You've got to take out um, a bunch of people with only one bullet. But every time you kill someone, you can change the trajectory of the bullet. Uh, and also some other factors, like if you shoot a, a car's If gas. you shoot a car, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's super creative. It's so yeah, creative. Cool. I've I've definitely never seen anything like it. Yeah, I've I, I had a ton of fun. The aesthetics are they. I I don't know if they intentional like if they've seen the Mandy the uh, Nicolas Cage movie, but it is very 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 similar mm. because you're also going after a cult, and it is very like crazy heavy metal nightmare energy incredibly so visualistic cool. too like the, just oh the, yeah the, everything is so visualized so, so perfectly it's mm. so over the top it's so nightmarish it's awesome i it's, love that I, aesthetic I, I, I love the game and i love that it's the final evolution of kill osama bin laden with a sniper rifle on congregate oh my oh, god stop <laughs> stop <laughs> No, it's, it's it's really interesting to see it kind of take the um uh, like I I've played a lot of like sloppy chunky games and it's very interesting to see sloppy chunka uh, a puzzle game made out of kind of the the bullet cam from like Sniper Elite or Sniper Ghost Warrior yeah um and and to do something interesting with that like what if it, this is what I would want if I was still eighteen and there was a good wanted video game mm, yeah yeah God very very good. Can't wait for this game to make whole new personalities for people. Oh, yeah. And that was Steam Next Fest. Oh, but I didn't talk Very about good. Supermarket Simulator. Oh, but Tribes oh, 3. No. I you didn't talk on about sex, please. You're just going to have to shelf that <laughs> for next time. I, I was thinking you were going to say, you're just going to have to shut the fuck up, Brendan. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say that. You're my dear friend, Brendan. Why would I do that? Oh, I'm going to kill you, Billy. I'm going to kill you. All right, that's it for the first portion of the episode. Now we're going to be joined by Hilltop Works to talk about fan translation. Ooh. I don't... That's a weird ass... Ooh, and then it just trans <laughs> transitions. There's a really? transition noise. Why do you, why'd you go... Ugh. Such a lust I for transition. Oh! <laughs> Welcome to the interview portion for Press Start Turbo. Today we're joined by Hilltop, a fan translator known for his work translating hidden gems of the PS1 and PS2 era that never made their way to the West. Welcome, Hilltop. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, great to be here today. Sweet, glad to have you. I just wanted to jump in just to get a little bit of a background for you um, and just for like a fan translation in general, just like what was, uh, what was the thing that drew you to it and, and what made you decide to start doing the work that you do now? So part of it was... It was kind of the combination of the things I already kind of knew how to do. Like I had been studying Japanese for a couple of years and I am kind of a programmer from my background. And, you know, this was a way to combine those two things in a way that I think could make people happy and I could show them some cool and interesting stuff. The first game I worked on was Dr. Slump for the PS1. And that game, uh, if, you, if you've ever seen it, has a very, very distinct art style. It looks quite a lot like the Mega Man Legends games for PS1. It really does, eh? Yeah. And it's a look that I just really, really love and wanted to see more of. And I thought that if I could translate this game and show it to people, that maybe that style could make a, a bit of a comeback. And in a way, it kind of did make a comeback. It probably had not much to do with what I did. But that low poly style, you, you kind of see it everywhere now. Mm. kind of see like, you know... Lots of VTubers use that style. There are lots of games like like Frog Gun, indie games mostly, that kind of borrow from that same style. And so in a way, I feel like I accomplished my goal, even if it didn't actually uh, contribute anything. You never know, eh? Yeah. Uh, actually, that was the that was the game that made me aware of you, because one of our one of our friends of the show, uh, uh, Creel, Creel Tube, is a very big Dr. Slump fan, and <laughs> he showed me your patch, like... I don't even remember when that was, like a while back. Yeah. Uh, I was I was just going to ask, like, uh, so were you playing these games before you decided you were going to start, like, fan translating them? Was it like you're you're interested in these games and then you're like, man, I wish more people 
that I like talk to, like can have the chance to play them. Yeah, that, that's 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 a big part of it. So these games and the, like the era that I pull from, that sort of late '90s, early 2000s era. Some people would call that like the golden era of video games. You know, that's the era that we got games like Metal Gear Solid and Ocarina of Time and. You know, all these like classics for a certain age of gamer, you know, obviously people who are younger than than me are not going to have the same kind of nostalgia for that same era. But for I think a lot of people, that era kind of encapsulates a lot of what made them like fall in love with video games. Mm. Like, I, I think a lot of people had a lot of like formative memories playing Ocarina of Time, for example. And even if they're a little bit older, that's that period was really when you saw a lot of game studios take bigger risks and try some really new stuff when it came to making video games, because that was the early 3D era, and nobody had really like un- quite understood what really works and what didn't in the 3D era. So you had a lot of like really wild ideas being thrown around. Um, just take a look at Racing Lagoon, which is the, the second game that I, that I translated along with the rest of the team. And there is no aspect of that game that is like normal. <laughs> the most normal thing about that game is the racing. And then everything else about it is just completely cuckoo bananas from the story to the graphics, to the presentation, to the menus. They just made everything as wild as they could because that was the era when you could just do that. You could have a completely wild idea for a video game and release it and publish it. And so a lot of these games I'm, I'm drawn to, and a lot of them are, are Japan only. And that's just kind of how it goes, because some suit at some point said that, you know, this idea is too weird. It would never work in the West. Mm. Western players wouldn't buy it. So you have a lot of these kind of hidden gems that never made it over and combined with the the era that they're from and the kind of the state of the industry at the time. It's, it's just a very, very in- interesting time to be pulling from to find things to show people nowadays. A lot of these games in 1999 might not have meant as much as they do to people in 2024. And I, that's the type of game that I'm always looking for when I look for games to translate. It's It's what can I show people today? What would capture people's imagination today so that's that's what led me to to dr slump and a lot of games like that that Mm -hmm. number one have a very eye-catching style or some sort of strong gameplay hook that immediately like if i can describe it in one or two sentences what's special about this game i think that's an interesting game to show people today like racing lagoon is a street racing jrpg where you can steal parts and make your own frankenstein car like that that's an interesting idea (laughs) on its own to, to tell people today yeah, so those are the types of games I'm, I'm playing and trying to show people. This That era of games, especially in, like in Japan, where like a lot of those games that really went crazy and took risks, basically, because like, they could do that, because they, they, they weren't even thinking about localizing any of this stuff, because all they were thinking about is like, we'll make it a cheaper game with a lot of risks and see like how or where, like, where this goes. Yeah. Well, you also got to come at it from the context of uh, this is all pre Resident Evil 4 and uh, Mm -hmm. before the homogenization of like 3D games and how they should Mm -hmm. play and how they should look. This is like a period where they're all kind of explorers and like there is no blueprint for how you should make a 3D game. It's just like, well, we have all these tools. How do we make this playable? And what is fun? I I think is is, is where it's like. Kind of comes really interesting, and it kind of draws to like games preservation and like and and like fan translations kind of role in that in uh, bringing these games that might have been lost to time for a lot of people uh, to to now, and that's that I find really really cool. Yeah, and and, and it's, it's not to say that oh people have worse ideas nowadays because like plenty of experimental interesting indie indie games come out now. But I, but I think there's something just novel about pulling a game that was made by, for example, Square Enix. Who, like uh, Square had made Racing Lagoon, you know, the Final Fantasy people, mm-hmm. and it's just very much not a game that they would make today. So there's something very novel about seeing like the world's finest studios make some of these completely wild games and seeing that budget behind them uh, that that you wouldn't really see anymore today. Um, because certainly we are seeing many many interesting games now. But I would say mainly from the indie space. If you're looking for things that are completely wild and out there, mm, yeah, for sure. I it's uh it's it's an interesting era to to go back and look at from our perspective now because like um so, some of these things just like <laughs> they just don't they don't like 
come at them with the same mentality any anymore in in terms of uh there's there's like certain ways like a, a you know how we think a camera should move in a third person game or mm-hmm. or how how we think a rpg like progression mechanic should work or something like that yeah when I, when i hear that a ps1 or a ps2 game has like annoying controls i get kind of interested <laughs> <laughs> because it, it's like I, I'm, I'm fascinated by like, especially like control systems in, in games and how they would map things to the buttons that they had. Mm-hmm. Like in that era, you know, like you said, there there were no rules yet. You could you could do pretty much anything. Like in in Boku no Natsuyasumi Two, which is a game that we translated recently, you turn left and right by using the D pad, and then you move forward with the X button. So your, your character controls like oh. a car, basically. <laughs> that's amazing um, oh that's so interesting but then you you realize like they had a really good reason to do that because the game uses pre-rendered backgrounds and moving between the pre-rendered backgrounds you don't have to like reorient orient your position as you're running between the, the mm. scenes and you just run in a straight line and it'll carry you through all the way so they had a good reason even if uh in the later games in the series they they kept that control scheme but also let you control yourself freely with the analog stick mm. they kind of made that concession in the end with the third game on PS3 that's a that's interesting they did you find um that out like that they're using these pre-rendered backgrounds when you're um cuz i i feel like a lot of people might not understand the actual process of fans fan yeah. translation. I, I kind of want to get into that because you, you have a very good video on it. It's not only about just translating the game. You have to actually put the translation in the game. There's hacking involved and a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, That's one thing that we are super... Like, when we wanted to talk to you, that's mm-hmm. like the big thing where we were like... Because I'm not a programmer. I'm not sure if Cameron no. knows anything about that stuff either. But for us, that's like... It's crazy how much work goes into a fan translation, and we really want to showcase, like, hey, fan yeah. translations are crazy. <laughs> You're not just going through the game files and replacing words in a text document. <laughs> you know, it's you don't have access to the source code. Uh, you're having yeah. to do this all backwards. And I, I don't know. I th- you, you have obviously done this, so I, you might want to give like a just an overview. Just so people can understand, like the actual work that goes into this. Yeah, uh, where do I even start? <laughs> um, it's 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 enough of a process that, like, like any any fan translation that comes out is basically a miracle. Mm. These games, they're computer programs, and they're they are not meant to be like split open like a coconut and then have people reach around and change things inside. It's it's fundamentally not how they're constructed and how they're put together. Talking about like the actual physical object of a video game, like a disc and the code that's on the disc, it's everything about it is is made to be difficult to reverse engineer and figure out how it works. But there are tools nowadays, and I have some videos about some of those tools like Ghidra mm-hmm. that make it easier. But the process is still a very difficult one to even like start mm. because hacking is about trying to solve a problem where you don't even quite know what the question is. When when you open up like some game files, you don't really know what you're looking for at first. You might have a few clues and without getting into like really technical language, it's it's a process that takes a lot of intuition. You kind of have to get into the head of the programmers who worked on it and try to figure out what they were going for with their files cuz you can open up something file in a tech in a hex editor and look at the data and how it's laid out and the first thing you might notice is oh everything is gibberish and if everything is gibberish there's a good chance that the file is compressed so then you start moving in that direction of trying to decompress the files and figuring out where the files are are decompressed and you look through memory as the game's running to find the uncompressed version and you, you can compare the compressed version to the uncompressed version and and then use that to find the actual decompression method in the code. Mm. And then you can analyze that assembly code and figure out how the game is compressing files by reverse engineering that code. And that's just one aspect. We are we are nowhere near translating the game, but even to <laughs> ju- even to just dip our fingers in, yeah, we're, we are we are suddenly tackling this completely weird problem about game compression mm. and file compression i had a friend describe it to me the the process of uh translation for like this uh, fan translation as the actual translation work is about 40 percent of the work 
And then 60% is actually just even trying to get to the point where you can start doing the translation work. Mm -hmm. Would you say, yeah. would you say that's like a accurate <laughs> assessment? It, it really depends on the game. Right. Uh, for example, for, for harmful park, which is like a shoot 'em up game, there is maybe a single page or two of text in the entire game. Mm -hmm. There is like a handful of text screens and that's kind of it as far as the actual text goes. Mm. But, but to edit that text, took like understanding how the game was storing the text because the text wasn't text. It was just sort of graphics. It was pulling words and letters out of a sprite sheet and doing it in the way that you had to really fully understand the PlayStation 1 and how it handles its VRAM oh. and how graphics are loaded into its VRAM and how it's addressed and how the files were contained the data to basically cut out little pieces of graphics and assemble them on the screen as text because that's all there was. There was no like actual text in the game. It was just a series of instructions on how to like use scissors and cut out little pieces of VRAM and stick them on the screen. That's how the text was stored. Oh my God. <laughs> you explaining that just made me realize how insane that is. That's so much work. Holy moly. Yeah, it was... Uh, it is a lot of work, and it's the kind of stuff that you just expect doing this. Like, there's no... If a translation goes, like, really smoothly, it's either a game that is in, like, a very well-understood engine, like like a visual novel, or you just got really, really lucky. And there are not very many cases of getting really, really lucky <laughs> when doing this. It's usually some sort of horrible nightmare. I've uh, I've noticed from the... Games that you have uh, released translation patches for, none of them seem to be in that category of uh, <laughs> very easy <laughs> translations to do. <laughs> I no, I've no. seen platformer, like, racing, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny looking through that list. I would say the easiest among them was probably uh, Dog of Bay mm -hmm. because that one was, and even in that case, the, there there were some very funny issues where if you actually open the disc and look at the files inside, like take, say, say you took a disc and you put it in your computer, what would show up? Well, the game files don't actually show up for Dog of Bay. I had to look through the game's uh, executable to find its like real secret file indexing table and how it actually loads files in and how it finds them on the disc. And then I could actually extract the files and, and edit them and look at them. Um, so even then, that one had like unique challenges that weren't present in any of the other ones. But once that was done, I had enough experience to the point where it wasn't that difficult. Aconcagua had some of the most ridiculous uh, challenges because the way that the game handles uh, subtitles during the cutscenes is... And uh, bear with me here. All right. So an audio file on a PS1 is basically like this big container file that has a bunch of channels. Usually, if it's video, video will be on channel 1, and audio will be on channel 2, and that would kind of be it, or the other channels would be empty. Well, what this game was doing is it was putting like audio on channel 1, and then it was taking the subtitle graphics and like chopping them up into little bits, and then duplicating all those bits, and then, and then spraying all those bits across the audio file so that they were being loaded as the audio was being played and putting together all of that stuff took it was one of the biggest challenges like uh, so far probably because it was just so so very weird how these graphics were being embedded inside of audio files basically that were being dynamically like puzzle pieced together as the game was running as the audio was playing um mm. And they were also compressed on top of that, by the way. Um, <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> a completely different compression system that the, the game was using to load files. Which game to you was like the most, like the most difficult to actually translate and localize? Racing Lagoon was very difficult for yeah. many reasons. One was the localization itself because the game's text is completely bizarre. It has this reputation in Japan as being... The the, the 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 letters RPG actually stand for racing poetry game. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> that's so. You're making me so interested in this game. Every time you talk if, about if, it, that's if so you weird. haven't seen this game, let me pitch this game to to the audience and, and to you. <laughs> this is like if you took 
the Final Fantasy team and told them to make Final Fantasy Street Racing. What does that mean? That means that the story is the story of this game. The plot is closer to something like Parasite Eve Ooh. than it is the Gran Turismo. L- l- let me put it this way: I don't like racing games. I- I've never like really had a great time playing racing games because I feel like they're just too thin. The experience of, of racing is usually so isolated in a game. Like I don't want to increase my license level in Gran Turismo. I don't really want to do stuff like that. There's not enough to draw me in to its world, to its characters. And so I usually still steer clear of racing games. Racing Lagoon is my favorite game of all time. Oh, shoot. Even though it is a racing game, because everything around it is so wild and crazy and rich. This game has a world map. It has characters and NPCs. It has like an open world that you can kind of race around in. It has RPG mechanics. You can level up. You can take parts from other cars and put them on your car in a very, very satisfying loop. It has some of the weirdest cutscenes ever. And there's really no way to describe it unless you've actually seen them because uh, they look like these weird render 3D, 3D, 3D renders of like doll people that are kind of just wiggled on the screen. It's, it's completely <laughs> wild. Um, I love that. And the story goes in just completely bizarre places. Like I said, the story is closer to, to something like Parasite Eve or uh, Resident Evil. That rocks. I love to hear... Those are the two where I'm like, those are two of my favorite PS1 games. So even just hearing that, I'm like, so interested. Yeah. To go back on like... Because uh, you did talk about uh, localization. Because a lot of the time, localization for any... For like any game that gets translated mm. to from like Japanese to English localization is always the hot button issue Mm -hmm. like what gets censored what gets changed i just like to i just like to know your view on like how you how you look at localization for games do you do you think do you go for a more like do you do you localize the language Mm. or the expressions Mm. or do you go just straight for like yeah i'm interested if you do a literal translation first and then go back and localize it or if you do it while you're translating like you just go through and you're like okay this makes more sense so and for people who don't know the difference between literal translation and localization yeah um, just give a a brief overview for that as well because that that might be something people don't know so i think it really really depends on the game um there are some games where I would try a certain approach and some other games where I would try a more refined approach or a more liberal approach. It really depends. I try to think about how this game would have looked and sounded if it actually did come out at the time. Like if this game was localized in 1999 or whatever, what would it look mm-hmm. like? What would it sound like? How would the language flow? What types of expressions would they use? And I try to do that because I want people, to, I want to capture the actual experience of the game as people would have felt it at the time. On Racing Lagoon, what we would do is I and the other translators, we would all like get together like in a Discord call, and we would just uh, like line by line go through the script, like as the game was was being played, and we would we would talk it over, and we would um, we would toss ideas back and forth, and it was a whole lot of fun to to come up with ideas that way. And it really fit the game because Racing Lagoon is, like I said before, the racing poetry game. The game uses the Japanese language in ways that it was never meant to be used. <laughs> like the game is just, it's a complete meme in Japan, to be frank. The way the characters talk is very, very silly. But at the same time, it creates this overall kind of atmosphere. Like it's, it, it has its own style. It's not just wacky for being wacky or being weird for being weird. It really does draw you in and make you appreciate what they were trying to go for with this weird like pseudo noir kind of a style to the text while at the same time dropping in like random english words in all caps and we tried to keep that stuff in in the english yeah. uh translation as well yeah we so that that approach we would we, we tried to come up with very very like good turns of phrases very good jokes to fit the jokes that were in the game very good um uh, flow even if that flow was kind of jerky well the thing was, it was jerky in the, the original Japanese, so we want to keep that kind of aspect of the jank in as well. Mm-hmm. So you end up with something that's maybe a little less literal, but more true to what the game actually was, which is that when people saw the text, they should go like, what the hell is this? Because that's, mm. what, the, <laughs> that's what the actual audience in Japan 
said when they saw this. They said, what the hell is this? And I'm mm. sure that's also a big part of the charm of this game. Mm -hmm. You uh, you talk about a team of translators uh, that you're in a Discord call with. How how like, um, how like many people do you work with when it comes to translation? I assume it, it uh, depends on the project, but um, like, what would you say? Like, How many people does it usually yeah. take to, 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 to do this? Yeah, so this is fan translation. So like people are free to, you know, join on projects that interest them and they leave when it's a project that doesn't necessarily interest them. Mm -hmm. So that the number varies a lot. On Racing Lagoon, we had maybe five translators mm. working. I would have to look up the exact number because, you know, the number went up and down as people were working on it. So that was actually the, the most number of people that we had was on Racing Lagoon. That was probably our biggest project for a good reason. That game is very highly, it was very highly requested and it's a very, very special game from a very, very special era. But mm -hmm. for example, Dr. Slump, I did uh, completely on my own. There, there was no team at that point because, you know, I hadn't released anything yet. So I, I couldn't get people to, <laughs> to, to work on it. So I did all the technical and translation work on that one. Harmful Park as well was me. But more recently, I've been working with another tr translator named Cargadin. And she's working on where we're doing our next game together, which is Rowdy Princess. I don't know if you saw, mm -hmm. we recently announced that. Yeah, I, I, I was super interested in that because like, I remember forever ago, I can't remember which convention I went to. It They had a panel about like obscure, like mm -hmm. super obscure games that nobody knows about. And for some reason, this game in particular just like caught my eye and i think it's mostly because of the the art style that mm -hmm. they went for on the cover art and all that i, I was just surprised to see it <laughs> like uh, earlier in the week when i was like wh actually i don't remember it must have been like jan like last week you posted about it yeah mm -hmm. i was really surprised to see that it's a very very special game and it's it's we think it's gonna be very big important game to a lot of people and mm -hmm. Uh, she, Cargadin, is actually the one who introduced me to that game. Mm. And when I played through it, I completely fell in love with it. And it, it, it hits all the all the marks of like what I said when the types of games that I'm looking to bring back is, you know, games that were ahead of their time, games that were underappreciated maybe when they were released and with today's audience in the West might actually appreciate it more um, now than they would have then. Mm -hmm. Something that just came about completely randomly was how many games that we've translated feature either a female main character or have some sort of like feminine tilt to them. That wasn't something that I was like looking for, but it's, it speaks to like that kind of game was being like actively kept from people and not released in the West, like games with female, mm, yeah. like main characters, like, like Dr. Slump, Harmful Park, Blue Legend of Water, a Maiden Machine Gun, and you know, the Rowdy Princess, all these games like have this sort of feminine tilt to them and were not released here yeah I, I imagine that's definitely a big reason why they weren't as well um you know mm -hmm. the, especially in the 90s you look at all of the fucking box arts for for games coming out in the west on the ps1 and ps2 and it's like some some buff dude holding a gun and that's <laughs> like it's like all right yeah. this is what sells in the west this is you know some like cute game with with a female lead that's like not about killing as many people as possible uh i don't think we're gonna sell it in the west yeah yeah and that's the kind of game that I think people are much more receptive to today than they were then. Um, you know, we have entire like directs dedicated to cozier games, more feminine games, like the wholesome direct. Yeah, yeah. And that sort of style of game has sort of come back, especially with some stuff like Animal Crossing. It's clear that tastes have changed. And, you know, if tastes have changed, then people would like to see what they've missed from that era. Yeah, I, I think I think it's a symptom of the art form maturing and, and its audience uh, in, a, in a way maturing with it and, and being more... Um, open to different kinds of experiences and and it's not that those experiences weren't being made back in the 90s it's just those weren't the ones that were getting money and now you have things like stardew valley animal crossing mm -hmm. as you say all of these mm -hmm. cozy games like unpacking and stuff like that um mm -hmm. that, that have just blown up and i think people are way more receptive and and i think uh, the success of your translations also show that as well you're talking about people getting involved in um, fan translation based if they're interested in the product uh, in the in the games themselves. I was just wondering how people would if they're like listening to this and they're kind of getting inspired. They're like, man, there was this game that I played mm -hmm. years ago or whatever that I they just never got that like translation. How would people like get involved um, in 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 this process and how would they get started? It's it depends what kind of skills you have and, mm -hmm. and you're coming to this. 
Like I, I, a lot of people come saying, you know, I'd be willing to, to fund the translation of a game. And I usually have to turn those people away because the reality of it is this would, it would cost you tens of thousands of dollars to, to pay for the amount of work that goes into this stuff. And I don't think people are willing to pay that much, but, but if you want to get involved and you have the skills to actually like either do the, the programming end or the translation end, there are like discord channels out there. Um, for fan translations and you could find people and connect with them and put together the right skills because like, like I said before, it takes a lot. Like on, on the project that we're doing now, it's like we have a translator, we have me doing the programming and we have, we have someone who is basically a professional old, old game box who's doing like graphic editing and video editing. You know, not everyone has all of those skills and it takes a lot of people and a lot of skills. Yeah. If anything is missing, then you have an incomplete product basically yeah i i I know specifically because i'm a huge ape escape fan and what is it called million monkeys Mm -hmm. i think saru saru get you million monkeys is one of the games that has a full translation but nobody like i i believe that the team doesn't have anybody that act can actually like hack the game and reverse engineer it and that's kind of where they're at right now and i know that like so basically, if you want to get into fan translation, you don't only need, like, they, there's mm. so many different jobs that go into it. It's not just, like, it's not just knowing Japanese and translating it. Like, people are also looking for people to program and, like, inject the code in, do graphic design, all that stuff. So it, it's really interesting. Like, it, it, this is always a team effort or mm. usually is a team effort. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, and that's the reason why so many like fan translations, like people have been waiting decades for a Sega Gaga on the, the Dreamcast to come out. The infamous like Sega game that was where it combined like all the different Sega IPs and, and like the commercial characters. And you know, that, that project has been like being slowly worked on for, I don't know, like 10 years at this point, And people are still waiting for it. Like we have no idea when it's going to come out, but we understand that it takes a lot of time and like you have to be willing to wait. <laughs> we talk about like the amount of work it takes and the amount of time that goes into these fan translations. Um, I'm just kind of wondering how, like, how do you find ways for it to be sustainable? Like, how do you keep the lights on while uh, while working these like uh, working on these projects that are that are kind of like passion driven and clearly like uh, you know they, these are these are games that the majority of people have have probably never heard of because they were never never shown them mm-hmm. like yeah like i i i take some money through donations but um you know not a num- amount that really remotely covers the amount of work that's put in so a lot of it is passion and a lot of it is recognition and that has paid off in other ways uh, for me i guess i want to be making the projects that people thought would never come out i want to be making people's dreams come true and and with that comes a lot of recognition. And um, to be specific, I'm happy to say that I've got a job doing this. Not not, not actually translating games, but uh, hmm. through the work that I did on fan translations, I was able to turn that into like a portfolio and find a job in the game industry that way, basically. So it, it has paid off, I guess, hmm. uh, even if it was a lot of work. For sure. And if it was... Uh, well, part of it was I had a lot of free time during like COVID era, which is when I started. So uh, I wasn't working then. So I was able to put that kind of huge amount of time into the first project and get that going, which probably wouldn't have happened if I didn't have that free time from COVID. So everything kind of worked out in the end, but that's not something that you can probably expect doing yeah. and translation. It's a, uh, it's kind of, it's a, it's a difficult one as well because it's obviously, you know, Square Enix has no interest in going back and, uh, you know, translating, uh, right. <laughs> racing Lagoon. But then, mm-hmm. you know, it's also, they, they also like would probably say it's their, you know, they, they, it's, it's hard to, I guess, monetize something, even though you've put in all of this work for it. Um, if it's still like, you know, squares, like, at any point they kind of loom over in a way yeah they're they're more likely to give you a cease and desist than than a job offer yeah i I wouldn't uh if you're trying to get a job at square don't don't translate their game (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> oh, actually, that's one thing I was wondering about. Did you have you ever gotten like in trouble for any? Because I'm I'm not sure like how these companies see these fan translations. I'm sure I'm sure the suits are not happy about them, really. But uh, ha has there any b ever been any like issues like with uh, with the companies of the games that you're translating? So so I try to be very very careful about the projects that I choose. Mm -hmm. People people told me that Square would destroy me for translating Racing Lagoon because historically they have shut down some projects. For example, the Final Fantasy Type Zero PSP translation was cease and desisted as well as one of the dragon quest 3ds translations oh yeah but in both of those cases like within the next year there were official releases of those games in english mm. so i can kind of understand very much from that that point why they would take those projects down with racing lagoon there was not a chance in hell that that game, that game would ever yeah. come back to, to be specific it's because the game has <laughs> Uh, the game plays very, very fast and loose with car licenses. Oh, <laughs> like, yeah. So, yeah. They, they just change like one or two letters from the car's name and just put it in the game and not pay them. Like Ronda Civic or something like that. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like the, the car that you started in is an 8611, <laughs> but they just call it an 86 Lev. So that, that's kind of the amount of gotcha. bandaging uh, they, they put on it. Okay. So that the, for them, local like doing a localization yeah. or even a yeah, they're like, it's, would, would it's out of the question. Way more they're way like, you deal with the Lamborghini uh, fucking lawyers, not yeah. us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. Okay, yeah. So basically, the the, the goal is uh, try and not pick a project that Square themselves is probably going to try and re release in the uh, in exactly. the West. Okay. Yeah, and and also don't touch anything that Nintendo owns. Yes, of course. <laughs> oh, that that's un, yeah, unsurprising. It, it, to be fair, I'm surprised the Mother Three fan translation never got any heat. Um, I was just going back to the actual process of uh, doing fan translation. Uh, you talked about custom tools for the for uh, fan translation that have been created. Have you ever had to um, go in and like? Get, create your own tools or anything like that have there only been situations where it's like oh my god this is so esoteric and no no of these other tools fits with the way this developer specifically wrote this or, or compiled this or whatever has there only been situations where you had to do that yeah basically every project i have to create a completely right. new set of tools i've lately been getting better about it i've created more like better tools for like graphic editing and, and image editing that i can reuse but generally or like instruction and insertion, you have to create that stuff every time. There are like some publicly available tools that can help you. Like there's a program called Atlas and Cartographer that help with text extraction and injection. But I can never really get that stuff to work. And even if it did, it didn't really have all the features that I wanted. Mm. And I wanted to be able to, to fine tune it all myself, have it spit out exactly what I wanted. Um, so basically, yeah, once you have figured out how the data formats work, you have to create your own tool to extract and inject basically. And you have to do that every single time because no, it's extremely uncommon for two games to have the same data formats, mm -hmm. especially like before, like game engines became very uniform. Like I'm sure with like game maker and unreal nowadays, you wouldn't really have that problem so much, but back then every single studio just made their own game engine and made their own compression and made their own text system and made their own image system and made their own everything basically for every single game. And so we have to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Billy, do you have any other questions? Uh, I don't think so. I feel like we we basically ran through a lot of uh, a lot of what I was wondering is like as just a fan of these games mm. and translations. <laughs> uh, Held up. Do you have anything uh, you want to end it on? I think we're, we're we're good. If there's anything you want to like shout out or tell people about to check out, yeah. Uh, stay tuned for Rowdy Princess. Check that out when that drops. Well, we're we're working on it currently. And it's we know this is going to be a very very special game. It's it's a JRPG on the PS2 that has some very nice art and a very very unique approach to like storytelling and the RPG genre itself. We we expect people to to really mm -hmm. fall in love with it. Also, the music absolutely awesome. rocks. <laughs> Sweet. All right. Uh, uh, check wait, out whoa, Rowdy Princess. Oh, uh, d uh, sorry. Uh, don't forget. Uh, uh, the the name of uh, the name of the YouTube channel, and I believe also the your Twitter is Hilltop yes. Works. Twitter, YouTube, Patreon. Yes. Uh, yeah, you should definitely check out the YouTube channel as well. A lot of, especially if you're interested in getting into fan translation, uh, your videos 
videos on it were very eye-opening. Yes. Um, and also, like, melted my brain a little bit uh, yes. to the point where I was like, this is so much work and I could not imagine... I'd be pulling out my hair every every single <laughs> second of a day uh, working like that. <laughs> no offense, but mm-hmm. my eyes were glazing over. I could not understand a single thing. You guys are way <laughs> smarter than I. The goal, was, <laughs> the goal with those videos is to like scare people off from the <laughs> translation more than anything. Because uh, you know, a lot of people ask if how to how to get started and. Instead of explaining it to them, I can just point them to that video now. So, uh, thank you, Held mm-hmm. up for uh, joining us. This has been a very interesting interview. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. It was great to be here. Welcome back to Press Start Turbo. Welcome to the community half. Today we're going to be talking about Stalker Call of... Wait, no. Shadow of Chernobyl. Nope. Shadow of Chernobyl. Shadow of Shir- nope. Shadow Shadow Chernobyl. Chernobyl. I want to say Call of Pripyat. Call of Pripyat's yeah. the third one. Yeah. As chosen by the Patreon, um, if you want to have a hand in deciding the next game we play, you can go into the nope. comments and suggest... Not the next game. The game after that. <sighs> the next game is Ape Escape 3. Yeah, yes! that's the one. Uh, if you if you want to vote on whatever games uh, might be upcoming, uh, you can head on over to the Patreon. And or if you want a game that you want to suggest that we haven't played yet, go into the comment section, and there should be a top comment. Yeah, the new poll is going to be up on Patreon whenever this episode comes out. So go check it out. Five dollar and above, you can vote. Yeah. Anyway. Uh. So yeah, Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl, GSC Game World, two thousand seven. Let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> I, talk. I love this game. It's one of my favorites. I, 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 I it's dated. It's so dated. That's <laughs> what I would. Is what I would say. It, it, it is dated. It's it's from 2007, and it was a small I, Ukrainian indie studio. That's why I'm trying my best not to be too negative. But I mean, I, I, I oh, also we should mention uh, we were all playing with the Zone Reclamation Project mod, yeah. and we were all playing on Master Difficulty before, uh, like we get yes. comments about that. They, I feel like this game already had it was already an uphill battle because post apocalypse is probably my I am so uninterested by that kind of setting so it was already gonna have a hard time grabbing me and I'm gonna be honest I did that game did not grab me at all I have a lot of issues with the game hey, it's itself. not it's not it's not an apocalypse it's an exclusion zone <laughs> okay well I I don't uh, sure. <laughs> An exclusion but you you get game. you get I uh, know I, I, I get what you mean yeah, like it's it, it's just not a type of vibe that I'm super into. See, I really fucking dug the vibe. I yeah I no that I was I was the, gonna say if you're if anything this game ha- does the vibe and the ambiance it's exceptionally it's well. one of the best video game atmospheres in my opinion. It nails the vibe it goes for. I fucking love in 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 Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl. I fucking love wandering around the wasteland and then just seeing a guy running into a tree because <laughs> there's a dead body there and he's like trying to examine the dead body but he's running into the tree and I get to walk up and just pop him in the back of the head and then 15 more guys are there walking into the tree when I like walk back to it I'm like oh let me just see? get a grenade and get a bunch of free well, you, stuff you see, the thing is you uh you get to you get to pop him in the head if the game allows you to that's kind of one of the big problems see, I have my favorite part Brendan is when I'm creeping up behind someone with my knife out and then they do a 180 with a shotgun <laughs> right as I'm about to hit them with my knife and they well, one-tap your me see your problem is you're using a knife instead of like uh firing 400 bullets with your pistol uh, while holding E to slowly slide out of cover and then you kill one guy, you grab a shotgun, you turn around, there's another guy there and then he blows you up in one shot. To be fair, Cameron, when that happened, because I was I was watching Cameron play because like one of my favorite games, I wanted to watch uh, my friend to play it so I could see his like reactions to everything. When that happened to you, it's because you paused because I said, is that guy's name Peter Griffin? Because it was something similar and you stopped to look and he turned around and shot you in the head. I did do that. I did stop to look and check his name, but to be fair, I stopped. I wasn't making any fucking noise. I didn't do anything, and he still just one. He just he was like, "Hey, you looking at my name?" and just fucking killed me. Oh, I mean, the the, the stealth isn't great. Oh, it depends. I had a lot of stealthy moments, but it was a lot of like um when I was in a bush. 
Like they had no fucking idea where fire was coming from. Like I had to, in a lot of like the, um, the not open world, like segmented world and a lot of like the, uh, the more open levels, I would hide in a bush and then pop heads behind cover. Cause like, mm. I know a big problem that Cameron and Billy had for sure. And I think a lot of people have is the accuracy in this game is, is I, I, I just, okay. I, it is genuinely baffling to me. I just don't understand why when you shoot the bullet doesn't land. I don't know if it's intentional, uh, but it, I feel like it adds a lot to it because you're not some like oh. trained soldier. You are just a guy running around an exclusion zone that you shouldn't be in using like rusty I, old AKs and shit. Okay. Okay, but I, I, I think I, the accuracy um, as somebody, um, where did we all get to in the game? I guess we should talk about like I know Ten has played it like that. That's I, yeah, I've I've played it at least a couple times. I, I I spent two hours, but I didn't get far because it's tough. The game did not the game. No, it's because the game did not want me to play it. I don't know about you guys, but mine crashed at least four times. We love the X ray engine. The it was always when I looked into the fucking binoculars, it would crash. I don't know why. I was a lot luckier. I only had one crash. Um, but it was a pretty hard crash. I had to like go into the fucking GOG oh. like task manager to close it. Otherwise, it was just gonna stay open on my fucking. Mine was not that. My when when mine would crash, it would just leave. It would just be gone. For comparison's sake, I had six hours of play, no crashes. What the fuck? None. <laughs> Where's on my one. machine? See, I uh, played two and a half hours. I want to say I uh, got up to the. Uh, I like stole a document from a guy in a base. And dash. The last thing I was doing was I like I think I spent like six quick saves trying to get out of the fucking building. Don't think Cameron made it to Strelux Stash, did you? Ah, uh, that'd be right before maybe then. Uh, yeah, it was at the military base, like on the second floor. There's yes. uh, some bandits uh, in it, third, or was it mercenaries? Yeah, uh, mercenaries. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. Got, I went under. I went underground first. Okay. Oh, so up. so you did do the underground. I, yeah, I did the fucking love the underground. In the Shadow underground Chernobyl. was awesome. It is awesome. I don't think I did the underground. I think I stopped before. I, I'm going to be honest. At one point, the game crashed, and I was like, I can't. I have to literally work on other things. I can't spend more time doing this. And I had to go. I have a, I have a really weird experience with, um, I, I guess, exclusion zone likes, because um, I, I really loved <laughs> exclusion, exclusion zone, zone likes. likes? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that. my God. I, I love um, three of my favorite games are Metro 2033, Last Light, and yes. Exodus. Uh, and ah. I had a lot of experience with those games before playing Stalker. And I see why people will say, like, oh, Stalker better than Metro. Because I... I, I after six hours of play, getting to the bar, doing the arena, um, how Stalker is so much more of an open experience versus Metro's yes, like very actually, streamlined. Mm -hmm. There's that's one thing I really liked was how I one thing that I really liked and it kind of helped with the game being open was uh like when you would find corpses of the stalkers on the floor and you would just check on them sometimes it would add like information from their pda into your pda and then it would feed into like this exploration where it's like oh there's a hidden stash right there you should go check out what's over there and then you go there and then there's a bunch of like there's always something interesting at the stash which i think was really cool and also it's very uh it, it's very like I don't, it feels weird how, f like, because I can't think of another game around the, around 20, 2007 that did stuff similarly. It, it does what I like in the, the, the parts of Fallout that I really love, or like, I, I hate, I hate, I'm not comparing Bethesda games to Stalker, mind you. Like, Here please don't go. fucking kill me. Every episode. Please don't fucking kill me. Please don't, the, like, destroy me. Starfield reference inbound. <laughs> <laughs> the the thing that I like about um uh, certain like video games where uh exploring leads you to more exploring like going mm. into a cave leads you to another cave or leads you to another dungeon Stalker does that very mm. well where you, you just find a body it leads you to a cave it's full of a bunch of mutant dogs and yes. you just got to fight your way out of there uh with like a cool rock that you found yeah that's that that's one thing I I do really appreciate about this game and I can f like I I see other games try to emulate it but they never they don't get it as much as it like this game is able to push you to explore 
much better than most games that I've played. I also love killing 15 guys and then slowly like backpacking all of their yes. guns all the way back to the vendor. And I'm like, I killed these five guys. They all have AKs. That's worth money. I want to oh, buy yeah. a new suit of armor. Oh, uh, I didn't even time to walk back and forth that. three times to do this. I, sell all this. I, I loved watching Cameron play and then Brendan updating me on him playing because Brendan was like, oh, the game is really easy when you figure it out. You just kill people steal their shit sell it and buy more stuff i was like you have to play early game stalker like a fucking rat and i love that i also loved not realizing until five hours in that i had a flashlight and that some <laughs> of the boxes like the boxes oh. are breakable and openable so i did all yeah. of the underground stuff oh. without a flashlight because i thought you were supposed to <laughs> oh brendan <laughs> I killed them all. That's it's not a big deal. Lord. Like the invisible guy was just like, I have an AK-47 with a full clip. I, I don't fucking care. Yeah. Die. <laughs> I, I fucking, that, that actually, that underground thing with the invisible guy, it was never the invisible guy that was killing me. It's like, I'd get him down and then a dude, a fucking dude would walk around the corner with a shotgun and it'd be all over for me. Oh yeah. I, <laughs> It's I think I got tough. lucky. The, the yeah. soldiers didn't proc me until after the invisible guy died. I feel like my most pressed button in this game was F6. Um, yes. Yeah. By it's far. One of, it's one of those games for sure, which is fine. Yeah. Honestly, master difficulty is perfect. I never felt like it was too difficult. Like pretty much. I mean, okay. M there's jank, mm -hmm. but most of the times I would die, it was a hundred percent my fault and it was totally fine. It's mm -hmm. very, um, what, what, what am I like gameplay experiences that I, I loved in this game was it's very, I, I like doing things in a hard-headed way sometimes. I like to be stubborn on purpose. So yes, when I encountered like... Yes, uh, you do. B Billy knows especially. I this. remember pain, huh? Um, but there are moments in video games where there is a... Basically like this is a base. You have to kill these guys and get a thing. Okay, I'm going to do this my way. My way is yeah, running through the front way. door and kill them. Okay, uh, F6 before I run in. Uh, kill a guy, F6, kill two guys, F6. Uh, and like, I, I don't know, like I, I really loved how uh, able I was to do stupid, dumb shit, bullshit things. Like make sure that this grenade that I threw would kill specifically like five people by just reloading over and over again and using my gamer time powers to <laughs> <laughs> destroy. <laughs> well, did you notice when you're reloading? I played this game like Groundhog Day. I that. That the AI will like change positions uh, when you re like the game state changes on your like when you die and you reload. I I, I don't know if I, I don't know if anyone else encountered that. It was the Do same you, with um when you like. Wait, I I feel like I know what you're talking about, but I'm not a hundred percent sure if we're on the same page. <laughs> okay, well, like um, what do you specifically mean? Like, like the AI will be in different positions, or it will try to it will do different things, and then yes. also I've noticed that. Uh, you're talking about how, like, when you search someone, it'll ping your map sometimes. Mm -hmm. If I die, I search someone again, it won't, even though I got it the first time, it won't happen on my oh, second save, I and it'll be a different that. character that will give me something. I think it's, like, might be randomized. But, um, yeah, no, I, I there were so many times where, like, I'd reload a save, and I'd be like, alright, I'm waiting for this guy to come up the stairs, and he just fucking never did. And I was like, this motherfucker, and he's just waiting down the bottom for me instead. I'm like, this... I got so frustrated of the game sometimes, especially when you like, I don't know, you sneak up behind someone, you're aiming a silence pistol, and then you fucking shoot, and it goes like far left, and then it, suddenly the base is all alerted, and you're like, god damn it. You see in the exclusion zone, everybody is Groundhog Day. Hey, it's just the zone. <laughs> I don't know. I, I really, it, I think it's a, you know, just the relic of a bygone age that whole the whole because like that is honestly just my major problem with the game i i actually really enjoyed a lot of e everything else i had to do with the game it's just that whole accuracy the way it works just kind of like ruined a lot of the fights for me because it felt I, I i get that it's supposed to be unfair but it felt unfair in a way that i like can't there's no way to control uh, that when i'm not in control i don't like honestly i would have rather the fucking if it wanted me to be inaccurate because I am not a fucking military shooter type or whatever, I would rather, like, I would have rather hold a gun and the vision bobs around. I don't know. Like, I, I really hate yeah. 
I would I would prefer that. Doing something perfect, like doing something perfectly in the game, not even acknowledge. Mm. It's like mm, that does that will never feel good. I think I I think I only had this issue until I started using the shotgun how I felt like properly, where like I was like, oh, like I wasn't thinking of the shotgun like a close range weapon. I was thinking of it like a medium range weapon. And once I started doing that at like the beginning, it, it is it is a hundred percent. Yeah, no, it is a hundred percent a medium range rep weapon. I I realized that very quickly. Uh, but it, I'm going to be honest, I, I still had issues with the accuracy or the hit rate. Oh yeah. No. Well, it, it, I, I, the other, the other thing I got to was the, um, like the prototype Fort 12 pistol. The, 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 the what? I don't know. It was like a, just a pistol I found that was like, uh, it, it just had like a little, uh, green arrow next to it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is, this oh, is weird. much better than the starter pistol by and large. Like uh, I, I could just. Yes, a bunch of guys. The, the little green arrow means that it was upgraded. That means that you found an upgraded pistol. Yeah. Oh, what did you guys think of the RPG elements? If you even realized it, eh. are you talking about wait, like wait, the wait. the artifacts? Um. Oh yeah, the artifacts. The artifacts are sick. I mean, because that's artifacts are basically how the stats work in this game. Yes, uh, artifacts and your. I I I just heard Cameron go. Woo. <laughs> what? Well, look, Cameron, um, use artifacts. No, no, no. I know artifacts. Sorry, I thought when you said RPG mechanics, I was I was confused. I mean, by what you they mean, are like, though. They are dude, the RPG loot rarity. stats. No, but you know what I mean. They are the <laughs> RPG. Like your stats are upgraded by these artifacts that you. I didn't see any gun score. No, I meant like. <laughs> Because it is an RPG, eh? and that's how you upgrade your stats in the game is by using the uh, by keeping artifacts in your inventory. I wasn't using any of them until I got to the bar, um, because then I started to get like really interesting ones that would allow you to like, uh, okay, so this one gives me plus thirty six endurance, yeah. minus mm -hmm. ten such and such, but this one minus is ten endurance, and then plus the such and such that I was missing on the other one, so I could make them coexist. Yeah in my artifact slots i hate reading percentages in games so i just put them all on um i was like yeah, all right i mean i'm sure fair. this will be like mostly good right yeah why else would it did the game me? did the game ever properly explain artifacts because i can't remember i feel like i i just kind of stumbled uh, on, I don't think it on it on my own i don't yeah. think it, yeah i don't think the game explains like a lot of things <laughs> no it really doesn't yeah. it's very it's a very much one of those fucking er, like you know late two thousands kind of kind of indie indie games where they're like yeah. we don't have enough dev time for tutorials. Even even if you like tell Sidorovich to give you the tutorial, yes. he is just like here's how you use your PDA. Uh, here's a map. Uh, go talk to Wolf. I think he only yeah I think he literally only says like this is how your PDA it works. Fuck yeah, off. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Go figure it get out. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I don't know. The, the atmosphere and the gameplay loop just scratch a certain itch in my brain that I love so much. I fucking love the anomalies. Yes. I did not interact with many anomalies. I interacted with one and it didn't do much. It just exploded at me. Yeah, the generic one. Yeah. I I wanted to see... I Because I at one point I was like... Because I've heard that some anomalies might be goofy or weird and i wanted to try to see if i could trigger one of those to happen but it didn't so unfortunate Ten, what's that fucking guy called the fucking zoom man oh the, the man controller you. i fucking hate i that love guy, him guy zooms you. he's so funny the what? uh there, there there's a mutant um called a controller that uh tries to make line of sight with you you get like a weird tinnitus noise to warn you that he's doing it oh, uh, and then he hits you with a fucking little beam that zooms your camera into him and you take a bunch of psychic he zooms damage you. i fucking hate that dude what? i hate when he yeah. zooms me he zooms your he, he's <laughs> he, fucking, he, zooms he, he zooms me and then he booms me i fucking hate the controller uh, uh, <laughs> i was trying to like kill him and then i was Fucks like you know what fuck this i'm out I here, like, I'm that's out fun here, that i yeah it's I, awesome yeah, i i i, I kind of oh, like that though that's fun God, i'm trying to um because uh, all, all the stalker games for the obvious reason of they were released very shortly after each other and they're all very similar like blur together in my head i'm trying to remember if shadow of chernobyl had um if your psychic uh damage gets too high uh i mean if it, if it gets to the highest point your screen goes black and there's a gunshot because your guy kills himself um, jesus christ but if it gets to certain levels if it gets to certain levels you start getting attacked by mutants that don't even exist they're just uh hallucination it's so oh, fucking boy. dude oh god some of the shit in stalker is so t fucking tight <laughs> My favorite anomaly is the Whirla gig because it picks you up and spins you around until you explode. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> but 
What, what I mean, like, when, when I say, like, how much I like the anomalies, it's not specifically the effects. It's that you don't really know... Like, there's a lot of them when the first time you encounter them, you have no idea what the fuck they're going to do. And trying to figure them out, like, it boils down to, like, once you figure it out, it's just like, it's just like, um, like a, a timing puzzle or just, just move here and stuff like that. But initially figuring it out by just throwing bolts at it and just being like, what, what the fuck is happening? Yeah, what does this do? Like, oh, I never do? even thought about that's throwing what, that's why they bolts give you the bolts. at it. That's- oh, that's why they give you the bolts. Yeah. They don't, you, you, I mean, they don't tell you that. They do not. No. They do not tell um, you. So why would I ever think about that? But now now that you say it, it's like, oh, that's so obvious. Of course you can do that. One of my favorite things from watching uh, Cameron play, because again, I was watching Cameron play because I've already played Stalker a bunch. I wanted like yeah. that fresh uh, perspective. One of my favorite things that happened to Cameron is like I was explaining anomalies and stuff to him. He was figuring it out and I'm like, oh, just throw bolts at it, map it out. There was a part where he was standing in a barn and there was just an ambient uh, breeze blowing leaves in front of him and he freaked out thinking it was going to kill him. Yeah, and I was I like, heard oh, fucking- I, I had the same thing happen to me. At one point, there was just a huge gust that yes, moves, and like- it blows some leaves in front of you in like a swirl. Yeah, yeah. And, and, yes. but it also like it's also super loud. Just like, and I was like, oh, man, I'm going to I- die. I, I love the ambience of Stalker because if you haven't played a bunch of it, like I can hear background noises and go, okay, that's a background noise. But like, there are certain things that sound like screams or growls that you're like, oh, I might just get fucked up here. I kept, I kept feeling like an insane person playing this game because of the cat meowing sound. Yes, mm-hmm. uh, the cat <laughs> meowing sound made me literally pause the game, look around, and be like, Beals, puppy, like what? Is, what am I? Like I, I, I even like opened my window because I thought there was a stray cat at my window. I was so like fucking like, why is this game making me feel like There's- a schizophrenic psycho? Is there a cat? Uh, no, cat mutants were cut from uh, Shadow of Chernobyl, but there's an ambient cat, like very distant cat meow, and like, like the ambient meow. sound. Yeah, I'm like what? Where the the the, the, the ambience yeah. of this game is great. Oh yeah, I I fucking it's it's insane how well done it is for such a small game. Like all of the audio, the the little like um. When you come across stalkers just hanging around a campfire and they're just yes, playing tunes, playing the guitar and just like chatting, yeah. And there's like, like all these. Like I remember you pointing out to me the first guy that I just like completely ad- yeah, avoided, didn't even by. notice. I just ran by him as this this dude just this dying sprinted by, by Tolik. What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I I saved the guy, dude. Every single I time I every him. single time I boot up a gameplay, I skip through everything because I gotta go help Tolik. He's my friend. <laughs> He doesn't even do anything. He doesn't even do anything. <laughs> I love taking quests uh, at the bar and then getting to the place where like the quest do, or the, the the like mission is taking place at, and it's like all the guys are neutral, and I'm sitting there like I'm supposed to get a gun back. What am I supposed to do? Where's the gun? And like walking around looking for the gun on the ground, and then realizing, oh. One of those neutral friendly guys has the gun that I need to get. And both times this has happened to me, a wave of mutant dogs has run in and then killed him. So I haven't had to kill him. <laughs> I realized another reason why I spent two hours and didn't get very far was because I spent a lot. I, I spent a lot of time doing the side quests. Yeah, it, no, it's a, it's a fun game to just like boot up and hang out. I, I didn't realize that I had to do the... Uh, I don't know that they weren't giving much of anything to me. The the side quest they they kind of gave me like I don't know what they were giving me at at the start. Now I know that they were giving me like artifacts, but at, at the time I was like, what the fuck is this? I'm pretty sure I started a side quest, um, and I was like, get this guy's jacket and give it back to him. And yeah, then, they don't they don't feel worth it. <laughs> see, I didn't complete that side quest, but I have his jacket, so I'm just wearing his jacket at the moment because it's better than my one. Um. Which, fair. which is pretty fun. Uh, I mean, one, fair. One of the things that I have to give Stalker um, a ton of props for, because I always bring it up whenever this gets brought up, uh, I don't think a video game has done factions like as good as Stalker has. That's something I don't think Cameron or I can talk about much, because we did not get far enough probably to have I've seen two factions. factions. Which ones? Duty and uh, Freedom? No, but even then, we, we I mean, like, yeah. mechanically, we probably didn't explore it properly to the point where we can see the benefits or the... Oh, I'm, not- I'm just talking about um, uh, factions in general. Like, the way that they're set up and the way that they're oh. written are all, like, very realistic reactions that people would have to something like the zone occurring. Uh, and the oh. only one that is, like, very obviously the evil faction is because they're brainwashed by something in the zone. Shout out to the monolith. <laughs> 
<laughs> they go, oh, Manolita. That's all they do. <laughs> How many? How many? How many of you got the chiki briki? Oh, that that's a regular bandit line. Everybody got that. Oh, they go chiki briki. If domfke. It was nonstop for me. Very <laughs> funny. Now I know the Mimi. Mm -hmm. You understand it. You actualized did, it. Did now you make it to uh, actualized the Mimi? Did you make it to um Rostock so you could beat the guy who goes get out of here, stalker? That guy. Oh God! The, the I duty, love that guy. At the duty place. <laughs> yeah, the duty guy. Yeah, every just time, out I, dude, when he did that the first time, I thought I went the wrong way, so I turned around <laughs> no. and walked back out and looked for a different <laughs> yeah, entrance just, to the bar. And I was like, "He told me to get out. I got just, out." He what? just he just does it every time you walk in. Uh, oh, but he's your dude. friend. He's not my friend. He's duty. We hate duty. Oh, I did the arena stuff too. I did all the um all the beginning arena stuff. I did. So that. What is the arena? Uh, just, uh, so the arena is in the duty it. faction like location where the bar is. You can't um, say duty, dude. That's way too good. Dude, it's a poopy. Um, ah. And basically, the arena is just like an arena. You you go in, they give you a specific set of weapons and armor, and then you're set to a challenge. Uh, one of the challenges was, uh, here's six bandits. We'll give you a cool fucking gun. Kill them all. World is a fuck. I'll give you 6,000 rupees. Or rubles? Rupees? Rubles. 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 Rupees. 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 Rupees are the currency. No, hey. Rupees. Rupees are the currency of India. Oh, I thought it, we were uh, talking about Zelda. No, ru rubles are uh You're telling Russian. me they make rupees real no fucking way. But yeah, I did the um, I did the arena stuff. I did like the first couple of those that you can do. Um, and I really enjoyed, I, I really fucking love the uh, arena in oblivion and I'm just, I'm still constantly and always miffed that they didn't follow it up in fallout four or in Skyrim. Like I got cut out of fallout four and in Skyrim, they just didn't do an arena cause you know, the grandma game. And like just having that experience of here's an extra little thing, kill guys for money was so uh, just, I, 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 I can't explain exactly how, but that was the moment where I was like, fuck, I love this game. I'm going to finish it. I'm it's going great. to play the other ones. I'm going to play Stalker 2. Yes. Uh, yeah. I'm definitely going to play Stalker 2. Yeah, I was going to say, I. this game is so dated, but I feel like Stalker 2 uh, might be my, my recommendation what? to you, Cameron and Billy, since you guys kind of like say that you like parts of it, like bounced off how dated it is. Unironically, I'm, I'm going to get crucified for this. Uh, try playing Anomaly or Gamma. Uh, it's super heavily modded um, to modernize it a little more, and you can just turn off the story thing and just like walk around and just enjoy the ambience and the gameplay loop. Mm. But I want to play the story thing. That's not the problem. The problem is like. But uh, the, the 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 story the story for Anomaly is like um, fan fiction tier writing, so I don't care for it. My big problem is not that it's the gameplay. Yeah, and an Anomaly and Anomaly fixes it, and Gamma fixes it even more. Um, I might also get crucified. Play Metro. Uh, the, I think it's different. They're different. <laughs> I mean, like it's way more, it's a linear, you know, linear shooter with story. It's not like it doesn't have the open. Oh, wow. Um, Ex Exodus does. I can appreciate Stalker. I just, honestly, I think I might even be able to finish it. It's just like one of those things where uh, I don't know. Yeah. I, and I'm coming up, coming at it from like the perspective of someone who I, I, I fucking love the Metro games, like that kind yeah. of vibe and aesthetic. Uh, I I'm super into so I'm definitely going to be playing Stalker 2 because uh, they're not going to do the same accuracy thing because yeah it's, like it's a modern game there's, there's no way yeah that's why that's like the big one that's the big one that's for me totally fair hey anomaly fixes that by the way anomaly makes the gunplay pretty tight uh, I'm, I'm I'm just saying uh, I I recommend people listening that you just try Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl first if it's not your thing but you like the vibe game of it. is stupid cheap yeah it's don't be afraid to use F six either like oh it is oh, it is F six use F six <laughs> don't worry about it like legitimately. Um, the first Bandit Camp I reloaded twenty seven times before I figured it Jesus. out. Jesus, the first I one it. I was the first Bandit Camp where you get the guys with you. I ran in with my pistol. I F six and then I just kept getting blasted in the head. So I was like, okay, let me do it this way, and then I just started blasting. Superhuman resilience. It took me a few goes as well. It it it, it takes everybody a few goes on their first time. I summoned my uh, what is it? My Call of Duty. My I summoned the spirit of like Brendan at eighteen years old and just started like blasting an entire clip into each enemy. Yeah, it's yeah, it's just it's just. I don't know. the The game is like needlessly frustrating in ways that it sh that don't add to the experience in my and how I, I feel about it. I agree. Like I, I think 
I really like the gun jamming. Like, like for instance, yeah. For instance, I like gun jamming. I didn't get my gun jamming. What the fuck? You never got your gun jammed? <laughs> it only happened to me once in five hours of play. <laughs> it happened to me like four or five times. It only happened to me once. <laughs> what the fuck? Now, now Cameron, my thing is, is I just kept switching out my guns when I found oh, the I, yeah, I, oh, yeah. Yeah, I also did that. I, I don't I, think every, my quality even got below half for any of my guns. Though. No, but they still jammed Mine never got below 80. So. Yeah, I, I would okay. nonstop switch whenever I saw God. a gun that was the same, but... Bunk-ass rusted better. weapons. You're a stalker in the zone. You don't got high-tech shit. I, I really like gun jamming. I liked it. I like it in fucking... Far Cry 2. Far Cry 2. I mean... I wish there was a cool... I found, like, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I didn't even think about it, but Far Cry 2, to me, I feel like that game... It, like if I'm playing a, a game in this style, I I prefer Far Cry too. This guy loves malaria. I love malaria. I can't wait to be old enough to get it. You love the hyenas so much. I really like Far Cry too. I I just like I like I you know I think I think I'm like on ten's wavelength on this game now. Like I didn't I I. I tried to play Stalker way back when I cobbled my first PC together in like a cave with spare parts. And I didn't get it because I didn't have a clear definition for what I thought about games then. And even a couple of years ago where I was still having problems uh, enunciating kind of what I like about video games. Uh, and now over the last couple of years where I've tried new things, played new things and kind of grown uh, as a person, which I recommend to Billy and Cameron do. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I, Fuck I, you! I, I did that like for an entire year! Uh, I mean, but what, by playing Persona? I... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, man, my social. You know what? Our social link. Our Tensai. social link just fucking broke, dude. The chain broke. <laughs> we are um, no longer social linked. I, I, goddamn, we can't do a combo attack anymore. This is so sad. I just really and and like because I've been playing this alongside, um, like a dragon infinite wealth. Is God? I needed something that would incept the brain worms properly in a way where I could shoot the gun. I feel like I've been playing so much slop lately. Like I played Inversion recently. Um, I have played Fracture, Condemned, a lot of these video games with kind of like janky controls. And something about Stalker takes everything that I like about certain slop video games from the seventh gen and concentrates it into an experience that I really, really enjoyed. And I'm glad I gave it this like third chance uh, and fully got into it. It reminds me a lot of when I got into Souls-like video games uh, after ramming my head against the wall for a billion times, going in with an open mind and not worrying about failure uh, and just kind of exploring as I can go and doing things my way regardless of fucking, like, I'm not looking up a guide. I'm not looking up how do I do this on Reddit. I'm not asking friends how do I do this. I'm just going in, opening up, and being like, it's okay to fail. It's okay to fucking fall down to the ground and skin your knee. Dad doesn't need to come and pick you up and put a bandaid on it. You get the fuck up. You spit on your skinned knee, and you keep fucking going. Um, Stalker's a very pull-yourself-up-by-your-bootstraps kind of game. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. <laughs> okay. All right, look, Brandon, I'll give this game another go. I'll I'll be the rat that you guys want me to be. I'm going to kill this no, base. No, play it any way you gonna, want. Yeah. Don't, gonna, don't have to play it like a rat. Play it any way you want. If you bounce off of it, that's fine. I, I play video games like a rat regardless, so of course I would attune my <laughs> to that. <laughs> You, you remember that when they did those polls where it was like, every ma mo this is the percentage of Mass Effect fans that played Paragon versus Renegade. And it was like 99% fucking Paragon. You're the 1% Renegade. I'm not actually, because I played Paragon. I <laughs> so you play like a rat. I'm just like a rat. Well, my thing is in any video game with an inventory... Um, I will hoard items to a certain degree. Uh, so like, I, 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 like in a Bethesda game, if I clear out a bandit base, if I clear out a bandit cave, or if I clear out a cave with got bad guys in it, I will take all their weapons. I will take everything. I will run to the town and then sell it. I, I won't like explore um, more of that area unless I have space. And then because I do that and I refuse to fast travel in games like that, I get to experience even more on my way back. One of the big things that I loved about Stalker, like Bethesda games, like I said, don't fucking kill me for this. This is just like, a, I played Bethesda games first, of course, like, is in Bethesda games, one of my favorite things about their open worlds is in Fallout, uh, especially 4, is going through and killing a bunch of bandits and then slowly walking back to one of your towns or walking back to Diamond City and experiencing uh, just kind of the random events and the, the world uh, as you went. And you don't get that experience if you just fast travel from place to place. You don't get that experience uh, without like slowly walking and Stalker offers that in full where I can 
go and kill a bunch of guys. And then on my way back, there's like a random event. There's a horde of fucking dogs and they just kill a guy. And then the guy has a fucking note on his chest that says, motherfucking goddamn, we got a bunch of fucking booze stashed at the booze cave, bitch. Find my booze hole. And then it's like, fuck yeah, I got five vodka because this guy died to dogs. So I found his booze hole. <laughs> like... The, the 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 parts of Stalker that I really enjoyed and that I'm more excited to explore are those moments wherein um, one of my favorite parts of video games is it's your character versus um, like the character like your version of that character and in Stalker you are very much your character and I fucking love that about it like ha thinking like what is my character going to do what do I want to do today what do I want to get accomplished today and setting out to do that task um, genuinely an amazing experience and I'm excited to play all of them and then hyper obsess about them uh, ad nauseum. I am so excited for you to do that. My One of my elevator pitches for this game uh, is the game hates you for playing it and you will love it for doing that. Uh, or you'll bounce off it and that's totally valid too. Yeah, I, I don't think I'm like, I, I'm going to be honest, I don't think I'm going to go back. Um, <clears throat> I'm happy I played it. One one thing that I am thankful for with uh, with Press Start Turbo is that I get we get to play a lot of games that are so outside of my like I would have never gone back and played Metal Gear Solid if it wasn't for the show and ever since then I got completely hooked and now it's more like I am I'm I think I'm pretty much like a fan like I care immensely about this stupid fucking universe and lore even though the lore of Metal Gear Solid <laughs> is. Oh, um, don't get me started on fucking. Hey, this guy, this lolly, about zero. The huh? Lolly Lule Low shit is. Lolly. Hey, no spoilers. I'm, fucking, I'm, I'm, I'm making my way no through the Metal Gear games oh, now. I don't. There's. I, it's so stupid. It's so stupid. Uh, I, I just picked up the Master Collection because you, it's you, you, it's, you looked it's like so you were good. having so much fun playing three. It's like, you know what? I'm going to play through three. three uh, I'm going to play through all three of them. Three fucking rocks and, and cogs. That's going to get mad at me because I'm going to play two. <laughs> I, I got to start at three because I started at one and I bounced off and then I started at two and I bounced Two's off. Fine. And I haven't Two's like fine. fully given three my attention yet, even though we were supposed to play it for the last one. I just, I didn't you have need time. To, you need to, you need to make sure about the controls though. That's the only thing, but I don't yeah, know. I would say generally, I would say start with three because it's the mo most modern, but still ha has those old controls. So then it and can it's it also, it, it, it's, it still has those fucking moments i do yes. remember really liking peace walker because that was my first experience with those games so i th i think uh playing three first preps you for one and two <laughs> it also is a prequel so it doesn't fuck yeah, up the works. story so oh, i think i th you know I think what it's like yak it's it's like the yakuza zero of this series in a way yeah actually yeah although five <gasps> plays way better but I that's play it. that's like a different thing yakuza five no. It'll get so oh late. yeah, I got so confused. I haven't played Yakuza Five. I should play it, but I'm gonna be I'm gonna be so stalker pilled for the next like month now. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Should it's we so get good. to? Some I love Yakuza Five. Comments. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let, let, let's talk about uh, pa Patreon comments and questions and feedback and things and th such. Sweet. Um, bro pews, I think. Uh, Ropes. <laughs> Bro, I always, I've always said bro pass, bro I've always said bropes, bro pass. All right, Brope no says, uh, Stalker <laughs> Shadow of Chernobyl is probably peak Eurogent game for me. I love its atmosphere and its general vibe of the game, but at a certain point, the vibe is replaced by way too many shootouts where it feels more like a generic FPS. Still love it, though. Uh -huh. Does that, yeah. does that, happen? Does that the, happen? I, 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 I would say... I, I know Ten has more experience yeah. with this, um, but I, I would say, yeah, like there was a moment where once I got past garbage and like right before, uh, right, right during like the military area and right afterwards where I was like, oh shit, I got to fucking, there's just so many shootouts and I'm just like fucking sitting there just maniacally oh, crack, like smashing F6, like, uh, it mm. gets, uh, I, I know with no spoilers for anything, cause that would be fucked up. And my friend Brendan here wants to experience it. The end of the game is really frustrating because it is the opposite of what the first like ninety five percent of the game is like. Oh, that's not. Uh, good. And it is just a long Call of Duty in hallway section, and it's so fucking annoying because <laughs> it's like I don't have enough fucking shit for this. 
this sucks. This is horrible. And I beat my head against it for like a couple of hours my first playthrough, and now I know. So, Brendan, whatever they're like hyping up that it's the last thing, uh, spend a bunch of time getting bullets because you're going to need every single bullet in the game. Oh, don't you fucking worry. I have 650 pistol bullets. Pistol? I am so. I mean, I also have 400. I also have 400 AK rounds yeah. and 300 shotgun shells. So. I have 20 AK rounds. I'm fucking dying out here. I, um, yeah, I, 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 just, I just refused at one point to use the fucking. Well, There's another big thing happening. is when you grab enemy weapons, you should unload them. If you right click on weapons what? that you've picked you up, can you can unload, unload them. them all the time. What? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, what oh, the fuck? Yeah. You can right click and take out uh, half a clip yeah. and you get a fuck ton of ammo. Listen, uh, I got a fuck ton of ammo without game, realizing dude. without realizing those blue boxes are openable and they have a bunch of shit in them. I got 400 bullets, 400 AK bullets without realizing those boxes were openable because I was taking every weapon off the enemies, unloading each weapon, and then bringing them back to sell them. Uh, Shadow of Chernobyl definitely suffers from mid to late aughts. Uh, PC game with like not a lot of budget uh like Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines my favorite game ever the ending of it sucks because they were just like we don't really know how to end this here's a bunch of combat sections that you just like kind of can't skip and are really fucking hard for no reason unless you've been preparing the entire game for them mm. uh but the first 95 percent of that game immaculate the last five percent of the game frustrating hard to hear from someone finding the first half of the game frustrating <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, it gets worse. Uh, <laughs> Start unloading weapons. You will get so much ammo, I promise you. I'm pointing at the sky <laughs> and saying, God is there and he's watching over you now. That, ki that kind of like changes the game. That for me. blew my mind um, a bit. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Why um, would I ever think of doing that? Because you're scared. Uh, like, I, I, I didn't use a flashlight. I didn't open those boxes. I was just grabbing all the ammo from all the enemies. And I was like, well, why, why is ammo a problem? It's not a problem for me. I'm like, what are I've, you talking about? I have too many bullets. I got to sell them. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> oh, man. Um, Clytus the Coy uh, says, uh, the 1979 movie Stalker and the book it is loosely based on, Roadside Picnic, were apparently sources of influence for Stalker. If any of you have seen the movie slash read the book, are there any similarities you notice between them? I, this is kind of a question for Tim. This is only a question for me. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Roadside Picnic is on my reading list. Anyway. Roadside Sam. Picnic is one of my favorite books. I love that book. Uh, I had not seen the movie before this week. I finally sat down and watched it. Uh, it's really, really good. Yeah, I feel like for me, the I don't know if I can get into Stalker, but I can get into the movie, probably. Uh, the movie is almost three hours long. Uh, and it's very, you know, pondering spooky tapes. It's like the most art film that I've seen. Uh, it's yeah. like five minute long shots with no dialogue, no music of just watching guys sit. It's a lot of walking around and nothing happens, but the cinematography carries that movie. It's excellent. I am nothing if not pretentious. Yeah, it's, it's, you, you would God, love it. It's, it's a movie for pretentious people. Go watch Stalker if you've got three hours. Um, <laughs> I the book, love it. really easy. It's only like 200 pages. It's an easy read. Uh, the only similarities between the book, the movie, and the game um, is they're set in... They, they never clarify that they're in Russia or anything in um, the book or the movie, uh, but there is a thing called the zone, and at the center of the zone, there is a, like, MacGuffin that uh, is rumored to grant wishes, and that's it. <laughs> that Those are the only similarities. Uh, the book or the games are like super heavily militarized because it's a game. Um, the one in the movie, there's really not a lot happening. There's a couple of parts where they're walking around and it's like, oh, something weird is definitely happening. But there's no like mutants. There's no guys with guns. It's just three guys walking around like the forest and dilapidated buildings. Uh, the book is a lot more all over the place with the anomalies. They're a lot more dangerous. There's, like, a part where some guy walks into something and all of the bones in his legs just, like, vanish. Jesus Shit like that. <laughs> yeah, so... Whoa, is that coming okay. to Stalker, too? Like... Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> That'd it's be a, fucking awesome. It's a sliding Fuck scale. Yeah. The, the, the game, the zone is really hectic. The book, the zone is just, like scary but there's like scientists that go in and out of it um and they're like study they're like actively studying oh it. my god like an scp i'm kind of like an scp actually uh in in the book they go in to get artifacts the artifacts are in the book in the movie there's absolutely no artifacts it's just the thing in the center of the zone there's like nobody who really goes in the zone except for stalkers why why wouldn't why wouldn't everybody go uh there, because then? there's nothing in there it's quarantined off by the police it's hard to get in and if you do get in and you don't know what you're doing uh, it'll kill you. I got it. It's just like the but you so, said. There's no, there's no anomalies. There, there are anomalies. They're just not 
as pre- in the movie. In the movie, yeah. Oh, would you say the game? The game is closer to the book or the movie the, in terms of like mm, what it's drawing from. Uh, it's a little bit closer to the book, just because the book has mm. artifacts. The, the movie literally just has anomalies and the thing in the middle of it. Gotcha. But like there, there are reasons that a stalker would want to go into the um, the zone in the book because you you can bring artifacts out, you could sell those artifacts and make money. Uh, in the movie, it's just like, oh, people pay stalkers to bring them to the middle of the zone, uh, and they're really ambiguous of whether or not there is something in the middle of the zone. And that's, like, a big part of the movie. Very good movie. I don't want to give too much away. <laughs> Anyone got closing thoughts on Stalker before we wrap it up? Go play it. It's cheap. It's fun. Uh, I mean, yeah. I, I, a lot of people like it. It's very important to a lot of people. Just because I didn't like it, I can obviously see why people do, and... It's cheap. If any of this interests you, I mean, fuck, just try it. Play it. Go be a rat. And when you see Wolf in the first camp, shoot him. Don't. (laughs) Do it. It'll be fun. Make sure you play on master difficulty because apparently there's some issues with the damage scaling. Yep. And also play with ZRP. ZRP and unload every gun, apparently. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. And press L to... Press L to use your Press flashlight. Press L to use your flashlight. And those white little boxes are openable. They have stuff and free and, treats in them. And those wooden <laughs> yeah. crates are also openable. What they are, they and sometimes they have free treats in them. Mm-hmm. And you can and you can use your knife on uh, things, and you don't have to worry about accuracy. You can utilize uh-huh. your knife on weapons and people. Or maybe go play Metro, and you can light uh, webs on fire with your... Flat, uh, you get a bullet lighter in Metro. You get a bullet lighter. You get a bullet lighter in that. You get a wife in Metro. Do you get a wife in Stalker? Right. I think not. Thanks, there's, everyone. There's bye bye. No Whoa, thanks so much for listening. This episode would not have been possible without the help from our patrons, such as Alan Diver, Art of Ogden, Beck Davis, Bjur, Bland But Funny, Boopoo Brain Soup, Caffeine Addicted Chemist, Chris Chapman, Christian Van Engen, Delling City, Dog Named Bear, DX Studios, Eric Scott Gillies, Ethereal, Generic Phoenix, Guy Beam, Handsome Destiny, Hater 115, John Requires Lasagna, Lambda, Leo the Geotech, Loudon Woodworth, Mr. Shirt, Random Diamonds, Rocco the Raccoon, Smeet Mono, Spherical May, The Frost Ace, Ulbert, Winnie Rab, and Will9455. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>